Philosophical concepts are challenging and often delve into the shadows of human thought. Among these ideas, some are particularly dark. These ideas aren't just brain teasers. They make us think about life and what really matters. They're like flashlights in the dark, helping us see and understand the tricky parts of existence. In this video, we are going to explore some of the darkest philosophical concepts. So without any further ado, let's begin. Nihilism Nihilism as a philosophical perspective is a complex and profound worldview that challenges fundamental assumptions about the nature of existence, meaning, and value. At its core, nihilism asserts the inherent meaningless of life, suggesting that traditional concepts of purpose, morality, and truth are human constructs without objective foundations. Central to nihilistic thought is the idea that the universe, in itself, does not prescribe any inherent meaning to human existence. This rejection of inherent meaning extends to religion, moral, and existential frameworks that traditionally provide people with a sense of purpose and direction. Nihilism contends that claims about the ultimate purpose of life are baseless, arising from human desire for structure and significance in an otherwise indifferent universe. One facet of nihilism involves the rejection of absolute values. Traditional moral and ethical systems, often rooted in religious or cultural beliefs, are seen as arbitrary and subjective constructs rather than objective truths. Nihilists argue that concepts of right and wrong, good and evil, are contingent upon human interpretation and lack universal validity. Existential nihilism, a specific strand of nihilistic thought, emphasizes the individual's experience in confronting the apparent meaningless of existence. This aspect focuses on the subjective nature of human perception and consciousness, positing that individuals must grapple with the challenge of creating their own meaning in a universe that, from a nihilistic standpoint, lacks inherent purpose. While nihilism may seem bleak and pessimistic, some proponents argue that it opens up the possibility for individual freedom and self-determination. By acknowledging the absence of predetermined meaning, individuals are liberated from external constraints allowing them to define their own values and purpose. However, critics of nihilism often raise concerns about the potential for moral relativism and societal destabilization in the absence of shared values. Nihilism has influenced various fields, including philosophy, literature, and psychology, and has been explored by thinkers such as Friedrich Nietzsche, Arthur Schopenhauer, and Albert Camus. It remains a thought-provoking and challenging perspective that continues to stimulate philosophical discourse on the nature of existence and the search for meaning in a seemingly indifferent universe. Absurdism Absurdism is a philosophical perspective that acknowledges the inherent meaningless of life but proposes a response that differs from the nihilistic acceptance of despair. Rooted in the works of existential philosophers such as Albert Camus, Absurdism contends that the quest for meaning is a natural human inclination, yet the universe itself is indifferent and devoid of inherent purpose. At the core of absurdism is the recognition that life's lack of inherent meaning does not justify nihilistic resignation or despair. Instead, individuals are encouraged to confront the absurdity of existence and the inherent clash between human desire for meaning and the apparent meaningless of the universe and to find purpose in the face of this absurdity. Albert Camus, a prominent figure in absurdism, explored these ideas in his essay, The Myth of Sisyphus. The central metaphor in his work is the mythological figure Sisyphus, condemned to endlessly roll a boulder up a hill, only to see it roll back down each time. Camus argues that life's absurdity is akin to Sisyphus's futile task, and in the face of this, Individuals must embrace the absurdity, continue the struggle, and find meaning in the act of defiance itself. Unlike nihilism, which often lends to a sense of hopelessness, absurdism encourages a kind of rebellious optimism. The absurd hero, according to Camus, acknowledges the lack of inherent meaning but chooses to live with passion and authenticity. In the absence of objective purpose, Individuals are free to create their own meaning through the personal choices and commitments. Absurdism thus posits that the search for a rational or transcendent meaning is inherently futile. 
But within this acknowledgement lies the potential for a liberated and fulfilling existence. By embracing the absurdity of life, individuals can find a unique and subjective meaning in their experiences, relationships, and endeavors, even in the face of a seemingly indifferent universe. In essence, absurdism calls for a courageous confrontation with the paradox of human existence and the creation of significance in a world that inherently lacks it. Antinatalism Antinatalism represents a philosophical stance that challenges the traditional view of procreation as a positive and desirable aspect of human life. At its core, antinatalism questions the ethical implications of bringing new life into the world, positing that life inherently involves suffering and that reframing from procreation is a responsible and morally justifiable choice. From an ethical standpoint, antinatalists argue that by choosing not to have children, individuals avoid subjecting potential offspring to the inevitable hardships and challenges of life. The ethical consideration extends to the idea that introducing new individuals into the world involves a certain level of responsibility for their well-being, and antinatalists question the morality of knowingly exposing someone to a world fraught with suffering. Environmental concerns also play a role in antinatalist philosophy. The argument here is that the Earth's resources are finite, and growing global population contributes to resource depletion and environmental degradation. Antinatalists contend that limiting population growth can alleviate the strain on resources, reduce environmental impact, and contribute to a more sustainable existence. Existentially, antinatalism delves into the uncertainties and existential challenges inherent in life. Advocates argue that by abstaining from procreation, individuals spare potential offspring from navigating the complexities, uncertainties, and potential disappointments that come with existence. This perspective reflects a consideration for the well-being and the quality of life of future generations. Population ethics also play a role in antinatalist discourse, with some proponents suggesting that a reduction in the global population could lead to a better distribution of resources and an overall improvement in the quality of life for existing individuals. The idea is rooted in the belief that a smaller population would result in less competition for limited resources, potentially leading to a more equitable and sustainable world. While antinatalism encompasses a range of perspectives, from moderate to more extreme views, its central themes revolve around the questioning of procreation in light of the perceived inherent challenges and suffering in life. The philosophy encourages critical examination of the ethical responsibilities associated with bringing new life into the world and reflects a broader societal discourse on the values and purpose of human existence. Solipsism Solipsism is a philosophical position characterized by extreme skepticism about the existence of anything external to one's own mind. At its core, solipsism questions the nature of reality, and posits that the only thing one can be certain of is the existence of their own mind or consciousness. The term is derived from the Latin word solus, meaning alone, and ipsi, meaning self. Central to solipsistic thought is the idea that everything outside of one's own mind, including other people, the physical world, and even the idea of an external reality, may be an illusion or a product of the mind itself. Solipsists argue that one cannot truly verify the existence of anything beyond the subjective experiences and thoughts occurring within their own consciousness. This extreme form of skepticism often leads to a radical subjectivity, where the solipsist views the external world as a projection of their own mind. Other minds, if they are acknowledged to exist at all, are often considered as part of this subjective projection, rather than as independent entities with their own consciousness. While solipsism can be intellectually intriguing, it also poses significant challenges. For instance, it raises questions about the nature of knowledge, communication, and shared experiences. If one adopts a solipsistic stance, the very idea of shared reality becomes questionable as everything is filtered through the individual's subjective perception. Determinism Determinism, as a philosophical concept, 
constitutes a comprehensive worldview asserting that the entirety of existence, including individual actions and moral choices, is fundamentally predetermined by antecedent conditions. At its core, determinism proposes that the unfolding of events is entirely bound by the present state of the universe and the governing laws that dictate its behavior. The crux of this perspective lies in the idea that, given complete knowledge of the current conditions and the precise laws guiding the universe, one could theoretically predict, with absolute certainty, all future occurrences. Casual determinism, a prominent facet of this worldview, posits that each event is causally necessitated by antecedent events and conditions, emphasizing a strict cause-and-effect relationship. This deterministic outlook extends into different realms, encompassing logical determinism, which asserts that the future is irrevocably fixed by the laws of logic, and biological determinism, which applies the deterministic principle of human behavior. In the context of biological determinism, human actions and choices are considered products of genetic factors. Physiological processes and environmental influences all working together to predetermine individual behavior. The implications of determinism for moral philosophy are profound and multifaceted. One of the central challenges it presents is to traditional notions of moral responsibility and accountability. If all actions and choices are predetermined, the concept of genuine moral agency becomes questionable. The very foundation of ethical frameworks that hinge on individual responsibility for one's own actions is called into question within a deterministic framework. The ongoing philosophical debate surrounding determinism is intricate and intersects with scientific inquiries. While deterministic perspectives align with classic Newtonian physics, the advent of quantum mechanics has introduced an element of indeterminacy at the microscopic level complicating the strict deterministic stance. Some philosophers and scientists explore compatibilist perspectives, seeking to reconcile determinism with the existence of free will by refining the definition of free will to align with a deterministic universe. Existentialism Existentialism, a profound philosophical and literal movement, emerged as a response to the shifting paradigms of modernity challenging traditional notions of meaning and purpose in human existence. The roots of existentialist thought can be traced back to the 19th century philosophers such as Soren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche, but it found its zenith in the mid-20th century through the works of prominent figures like Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus. At its heart, existentialism dismisses the idea of predetermined objective meaning in life asserting instead that individuals must actively construct their own significance through their choices and actions. This foundational tenet, encapsulated in the phrase, existence precedes essence, marks a departure from existentialist philosophies, contending that individuals exist first and then define their essence through the unique unfolding of their lives. A cornerstone of existentialist philosophy is the emphasis on individual freedom and the concomitant responsibility that accompanies it. Existentialists argue that true freedom entails taking full responsibility for the consequences of one's choices, an empowering yet burdensome realization that distinguishes existentialism from deterministic or fatalistic viewpoints. This recognition of freedom lays the groundwork for an exploration of the complex interplay between personal agency and the unpredictable nature of the world. Existentialism delves into the realm of human emotions, acknowledging the inherent anxiety and despair that arise when one grapples with the realization of life's lack of inherent meaning. This sense of existential dread, often referred to as angst, is considered an integral part of the human experience, prompting individuals to confront the inherent uncertainties and absurdities of existence. Existentialism arguing individuals to live in accordance with their true selves and values. Authenticity involves a deep, introspective journey, a commitment to facing the challenges of existence honestly, and making choices that align with one's core beliefs, even in the face of societal norms or expectations. 
Central to existentialist thought is the notion of the absurd, signifying the perceived lack of rational meaning in the universe. Existentialists assert that individuals must confront and embrace this absurdity, finding meaning not in some transcendent purpose, but in the very act of living itself. The absurd becomes a dynamic force that propels individuals forward to a heightened awareness of their existence, fostering a sense of individual responsibility for creating meaning within the context of an inherently indifferent world. Existentialism's profound impact extends beyond philosophy into literature, psychology, and theology, influencing a myriad of artistic and intellectual pursuits. Works such as Camus' The Stranger and Sartier's Nausea exemplify the existentialist's ethos in literature, exploring the complexities of human experience in a seemingly indifferent universe. Existentialist themes also resonate in psychological thought, particularly in the development of existential psychotherapy, which examines the human experience in the absence of predetermined meaning. Eternal Recurrence Eternal recurrence is a philosophical concept that originated in the works of the 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, notably in his book Thus Spoke Zarathustra. The idea centers around the notion that the universe and all the events within it are eternally recurring in an infinite cycle, playing out identically over and over again. Nietzsche's concept of the eternal recurrence goes beyond a mere cosmological or physical repetition of events. It encompasses the entire spectrum of individual lives, experiences, and choices. In proposing this idea, Nietzsche challenges individuals to confront the ultimate consequences of their actions and choices. The thought experiment associated with eternal recurrence asks individuals to consider whether they would be willing to relive their lives with all of their joys and suffering in an unending loop. The philosophical implications of eternal recurrence are profound. Nietzsche suggested that living a life that one would be willing to relive for eternity imparts a sense of authenticity and purpose. This challenges individuals to embrace their existence fully to make meaningful choices, and to live in a way that aligns with their deepest values. The concepts encourage a re-evaluation of one's actions and decisions, prompting a search for a life worth reliving. While Nietzsche did not present eternal recurrence as a literal cosmological theory, he used it as a metaphorical device to explore profound existential themes. The idea serves as a thought experiment designed to provoke introspection and encourage individuals to live with a heightened awareness of the significance of their choices. The concept of eternal recurrence has resonated beyond Nietzsche's philosophy, influencing literature, psychology, and popular culture. It echoes in the existentialist notion of living an authentic life and making choices with a profound sense of responsibility. Additionally, it has inspired artistic and literary works, with authors and thinkers exploring the implications of the eternal return on the human psyche and the pursuit of a life rich in meaning and significance. The Simulation Hypothesis The Simulation Hypothesis is a speculative concept that suggests our reality, including the entire universe and everything within it, might be a computer-generated simulation or artificial construct. This idea has gained attention and interest, particularly in the realms of philosophy and theoretical physics, although it is important to note that it remains a hypothesis without empirical evidence. The basic premise of the simulation hypothesis posits that an advanced civilization, possibly far more technologically advanced than our own, has the capability and motivation to create a computer simulation that is indistinguishable from what we perceive as reality. Proponents of this hypothesis argue that if such a simulation were sufficiently advanced, its inhabitants, essentially us, would be conscious and unaware of the artificial nature of their existence. The simulation hypothesis draws inspiration from advancement in computing power, virtual reality, and our own increasing ability to simulate realistic environments. It was popularized by philosopher Nick Bostrom in his 2003 paper entitled are you living in a computer simulation? In this paper, Bostrom formulates the simulation argument, which proposes three scenarios. 
Either civilizations do not reach a post-human stage capable of running ancestor simulations, or if they do, they are not interested in running such simulations, or we are almost certainly living in a computer simulation. Supporters of the simulation hypothesis often cite the rapid progress in computing technology, the potential for future advancements, and the development of increasingly sophisticated virtual reality simulations as reasons to consider the possibility of our reality being a simulated construct. Additionally, they point to certain features of our universe, such as the apparent quantization of space, as potential clues or glitches in the simulation. Critics, however, argue that the simulation hypothesis is speculative and lacks empirical evidence. They contend that the idea is more of a philosophical or metaphysical speculation than a testable scientific theory. Furthermore, some critics argue that the simulation argument may be based on assumptions about the motivations and capabilities of hypothetical future civilizations. The Problem of Evil The Problem of Evil is a long-standing philosophical and theological quandary that delves into the apparent inconsistency between the existence of evil and the belief in an all-powerful and benevolent deity. This complex challenge has been a focal point in the philosophy of religion, prompting rigorous examinations of the nature of God, morality, and the coexistence of suffering and divine goodness. The logical facet of the problem of evil posits a seemingly irreconcilable contradiction. If God possesses omnipotence, omniscience, and omnibenevolence, then the logical expectation would be the prevention of evil. The apparent incongruity arises from the coexistence of a deity with all of these attributes and the undeniable existence of evil. The evidential aspect shifts the focus to the empirical reality of suffering, arguing that the sheer volume and intensity of gratuitous pain and evil make it improbable that an all-powerful and perfectly good God exists. Responses to the problem of evil vary, and theologians, philosophers, and religious thinkers have proposed diverse explanations. Some contend that human free will, despite its potential for moral evil, is a necessary condition for meaningful relationships and moral responsibility. This perspective introduces the idea that the existence of evil is a consequence of the greater good of autonomy and moral choice. Other posits, the complexity of divine purpose beyond human comprehension may involve a grander design that includes the existence of evil for reasons unknown to us. Furthermore, discussions around theosity, the attempt to reconcile the existence of evil with the attributes of a benevolent and all-powerful God, often involve considerations of divine justice, the role of suffering in spiritual growth, and the potential for a redemptive plan that transcends our understanding. While some argue for the mystery of God's ways and the limits of human comprehension, others seek to provide nuanced theodicies that address specific forms of evil, such as natural disasters or moral wrongdoing. Pessimism Pessimism is a philosophical and psychological perspective that tends to emphasize the negative aspects of life and the belief that overall, existence is characterized by suffering, difficulties, and unfavorable outcomes. This worldview contrasts with optimism, which generally sees life through a more positive lens. Philosophically, pessimism has roots in various schools of thought, including existentialism, nihilism, and certain branches of Eastern philosophy. Arthur Schopenhauer, a 19th century German philosopher, is often associated with pessimistic views, particularly his belief in the inherent suffering of existence and the predominance of a will to live that leads to dissatisfaction and striving. Existentialist thinkers, such as Jean-Paul Sartre, also explored pessimistic themes, emphasizing the individual's responsibility to create meaning in a seemingly indifferent and absurd world. Nihilism, on the other hand, posits that life lacks inherent meaning or value, which can lead to a pessimistic outlook. Psychologically, pessimism is a cognitive bias that influences how individuals interpret events and make predictions about the future. Pessimistic individuals tend to anticipate negative outcomes, expect the worst, and may have a more cynical or downbeat perspective. This can influence their emotional well-being, 
decision-making, and overall approach to life. Despite its negative connotations, some argue that pessimism has its merits. Philosophically, it can serve as a critical lens encouraging individuals to question assumptions about happiness, meaning, and the human condition. Psychologically, a measured degree of pessimism might be associated with cautious decision-making and realistic expectations. However, excessive or unwarranted pessimism can lead to a diminished quality of life, increased stress, and a sense of hopelessness. Balancing a critical awareness of life's challenges with an ability to find meaning, resilience, and joy is a nuanced aspect of navigating a complex world. Moral Relativism Moral relativism is a philosophical perspective that asserts that moral judgments are not universally true or false, but are instead relative to the culture, historical, or individual context in which they arise. This viewpoint rejects the idea of absolute moral truths that apply universally to all people, regardless of their cultural background or personal beliefs. According to moral relativism, what is considered morally right or wrong can vary from one culture to another, or even from one individual to another. Proponents of moral relativism argue that cultural diversity and individual differences should be taken into account when evaluating moral claims. They emphasize the importance of understanding and respecting the cultural and historical context in which moral judgments are made. However, critics of moral relativism often raise concerns about the potential for moral relativism to undermine the idea of objective moral standards. They argue that without a foundation of universal moral truths, moral discourse becomes arbitrary and lacks a solid basis for ethical decision-making. In everyday terms, moral relativism prompts us to consider that different societies or individuals might have distinct moral codes shaped by their unique perspectives, values, and histories. It challenges us to engage in open dialogue and understanding rather than assuming a single universally acceptable set of moral principles. While it fosters tolerance and cultural sensitivity, Moral relativism also invites ongoing discussions about the nature of morality and the possibility of finding common ground amid diverse ethical perspectives. Hedonistic Calculus Hedonistic calculus is a concept associated with utilitarianism, a philosophical perspective that evaluates actions based on their overall utility or happiness produced. Coined by Jeremy Bentham, the hedonistic calculus is a method for calculating the moral worth of an action by considering the pleasure and pain it generates. The underlying idea is that the value of an action can be measured in terms of the pleasure it brings and the pain it avoids or causes. Utilitarianism posits that the morally right action is the one that maximizes overall happiness or pleasure and minimizes suffering. The hedonistic calculus provides a systematic approach to assessing the consequences of the actions in terms of their impact on happiness. Bentham proposed seven criteria for evaluating the intensity and duration of pleasure and pain, including factors like intensity, duration, certainty or uncertainty, propinquity or remoteness, fecundity or fruitfulness, purity or impurity, and extent. Critics of utilitarianism including John Stuart Mill, a later advocate of utilitarianism, have argued that the hedonistic calculus oversimplifies the complexities of human experience. They contend that not all pleasures are equal and that qualitative differences in types of pleasure should be taken into account. Additionally, the ability of individuals to make subjective judgments about their own happiness complicates the application of a standardized calculus. In essence, the hedonistic calculus reflects an attempt to bring a degree of objectivity and quantifiability to ethical decision-making by grounding it in the consequences of actions. However, the challenges in precisely measuring and comparing subjective experiences, along with the recognition of the multifaceted nature of pleasure, have led to ongoing debates and refinements within the utilitarian philosophy. Cybernetic Immortality 
The concept of cybernetic immortality delves into the intersection of technology and the human desire for eternal existence. It involves the idea of preserving consciousness or the essence of an individual beyond the limitations of the biological body through the use of advanced technologies often associated with artificial intelligence, robotics, and cybernetics. In this speculative concept, proponents envision a future where the human mind can be transferred or uploaded into a non-biological substrate, such as a computer or a robotic body, allowing for the preservation of one's identity and consciousness. The motivation behind cybernetic immortality often stems from the fear of death and the human instinct for self-preservation. From a philosophical perspective, the notion of cybernetic immortality raises profound questions about the nature of identity, consciousness, and the continuity of self. It challenges traditional notions of mortality and the significance of the body in defining who we are. Critics argue that such concepts may overlook the intricate interplay between the physical and experimental aspects of human existence, and that reducing consciousness to mere data raises ethical and existential concerns. The pursuit of cybernetic immortality also intersects with discussions about the potential impacts on society, relationships, and the meaning of life. If individuals could theoretically exist indefinitely in a digital form, how would this affect our understanding of time, purpose, and the value we place on fleeting experiences? In contemplating cybernetic immortality, individuals and societies grapple with both the promise of extended existence and the potential consequences of tampering with the fundamental aspects of human nature. It serves as a thought experiment that challenges our understanding of life, consciousness, and the ethical considerations surrounding the application of advanced technologies to the very essence of our being. As of now, the realization of cybernetic immortality remains firmly within the realm of speculation and remains a topic of exploration in science fiction and philosophical discourse. Fatalism Fatalism is a philosophical perspective that holds the belief in the inevitability of events, suggesting that everything, including human actions and outcomes, is predetermined and cannot be altered by individual will or effort. In a fatalistic worldview, the course of events is considered to be fixed, and individuals have no genuine power to change the predetermined course of their lives. The concept of fatalism stands in contrast to ideas of free will and personal agency. While fatalism suggests a lack of control over one's destiny, proponents of free will argue that individuals possess the ability to make choices and shape their own lives. Fatalism often arises in discussions about determinism, which asserts that all events, including human interactions, are governed by pre-existing conditions and natural laws, leaving no room for true randomness or free will. From a psychological and existential standpoint, fatalism can have various effects on individuals. Some may find solace in the idea that their fate is preordained, providing a sense of acceptance in the face of life's uncertainties. However, fatalism can also lead to a sense of resignation, as individuals may feel powerless to influence their circumstances or work towards personal goals. Philosophically, Fatalism prompts inquiries into the nature of causality, destiny, and the possibilities for meaningful action in a world where events seem predetermined. Critics of fatalism often argue that it oversimplifies the complex interplays of factors that shape human existence and neglects the role of individual choices and responsibility. In contemplating fatalism, individuals and philosophers grapple with questions about the nature of time, causation, and the extent to which individuals can shape their destinies. It's a concept that has been explored and debated throughout the history of philosophy, raising fundamental questions about the nature of human agency and the degree to which we have control over the unfolding of our lives. Cosmicism Cosmicism is a philosophical and literary concept associated with the works of American writer H.P. Lovecraft. It reflects a worldview that emphasizes the insignificance of humanity in the vastness of the cosmos and the existence of an incomprehensible, indifferent, and often malevolent cosmic forces that transcend human understanding. In Lovecraft's stories, the universe is depicted as populated by ancient and powerful entities, 
often referred to as the Great Old Ones, or cosmic deities, indifferent to human concerns. These entities exist beyond the comprehension of human minds, and encounters with them typically result in madness or existential despair. Cosmicism portrays a cosmos where humans are tiny, transient beings in the face of incomprehensible and often malevolent cosmic forces. The philosophy of cosmicism challenges anthropocentrism, the idea that humans are the central or most significant entities in the universe. Instead, it suggests that the cosmos operates on principles and scales far beyond human understanding, and that the universe is indifferent or even hostile to human existence. Lovecraft's writings often evoke a sense of cosmic horror, where the true terror lies not in conventional monsters, but in the realization of humanity's utter insignificance and vulnerability in the cosmic scheme. Philosophically, cosmicism raises questions about the limits of human knowledge, the nature of existence, and the psychological impact of confronting the unknown and the incomprehensible. It also challenges traditional anthropocentric views that place humanity at the center of cosmic significance. While cosmicism originated in the context of Lovecraft's fiction, it has influenced broader discussions in philosophy and literature about existentialism, the nature of the cosmos, and the limits of human understanding. It serves as a reminder of the mysteries and terrors that may lie beyond the boundaries of human knowledge and the unsettling idea that our place in the cosmos is precarious and ultimately inconsequential. The Dream Argument the dream argument is a philosophical concept that delves into skepticism about the nature of reality and the reliability of our perceptions. The idea is often associated with philosophers like René Descartes, and later discussed by thinkers such as Schwanza, who posed the question of whether we can truly distinguish between waking life and dreams. At its core, the dream argument suggests that it is possible that everything we experience, including our current reality and perceptions, might be part of a dream or an illusion. The argument challenges the certainty of our sensory experiences and questions the reliability of our judgments about what is real. Descartes famously explored similar themes in his Meditations on First Philosophy, where he raised doubts about the trustworthiness of the senses and even the existence of an external world. From a philosophical standpoint, the dream argument serves as a thought experiment that pushes to question the foundations of our knowledge. If we cannot be certain whether we are currently dreaming or awake, it undermines the notion that our perceptions provide a reliable basis for understanding reality. This line of reasoning contributes to broader discussions about epistemology, the study of knowledge, and the criteria we use truth or falsity our beliefs. While the dream argument doesn't necessarily lead to the conclusion that everything is a dream, it highlights the limitations of our sensory experiences and the potential for doubt about the nature of reality. Philosophers have explored various responses to this challenge, ranging from attempts to establish a secure foundation for knowledge to embracing a kind of radical skepticism about the external world. The Ship of Theseus the Ship of Theseus is a classical philosophical thought experiment that raises questions about identity, persistence, and the nature of objects over time. The scenario involves a ship belonging to the mythical Greek hero Theseus. Over the years, as its wooden parts decay, each piece is replaced with a new one. The central question posed is whether the ship remains the same entity, or if it becomes an entirely different ship as the replacements accumulate. The thought experiment prompts a deeper exploration of the concept of identity and the conditions under which we attribute sameness to an object. It touches on the issues of continuity, transformation, and the relationship between the whole and its individual parts. Philosophers have extended the ship of Theseus scenario to various related questions. For example, if the removed planks and parts of the original ship are gathered and reassembled into a new ship, which one is the true? ship of Theseus. Additionally, the thought experiment is often applied to discussions about personal identity, prompting inquiries into whether a person remains the same individual over time despite changes in physical or psychological attributes. The ship of Theseus invites contemplation on the nature of persistence and change, 
challenging our intuitions about the stability and unity of objects. It also raises questions about the criteria we use to determine the identity of an object or a person and the philosophical implications of gradual, incremental transformations. Double Think Double Think is a concept introduced in George Orwell's dystopian novel, 1984. It describes the act of simultaneously accepting two contradictory beliefs or ideas and holding them to be true. In the totalitarian regime depicted in the novel, the ruling party employs doublethink as a method of psychological control over the populace. The term doublethink is a compound of double and think, and it encapsulates the idea of holding two conflicting thoughts in one's mind without recognizing the inherent contradiction. Citizens in the fictional world of 1984 are subjected to propaganda that promotes contradictory statements, and they are conditioned to accept both ideas without questioning or reconciling the inconsistency. Doublethink plays a crucial role in maintaining the power of the ruling party by manipulating reality and controlling the narrative. It reflects the theme of thought control and the distortion of truth to serve the interest of those in power. The concept is not just a fictional construct, but also serves as a powerful metaphor for the ways in which authoritarian regimes can manipulate language and perception to maintain control over the population. Philosophically, Doublethink raises the questions about the malleability of beliefs, the power of propaganda, and the nature of cognitive dissonance. It underscores the potential dangers of a society where individuals are compelled to accept contradictory ideas blurring the line between truth and falsehood, and undermining the capacity for critical thinking. The Last Thursdayism Last Thursdayism is a philosophical and theological concept that serves as a thought experiment challenging the reliability of our perceptions and the nature of reality. The idea posits that the universe, along with all of its apparent history and memories, may have been created last Thursday, giving the illusion of a much longer existence. The thought experiment typically unfolds as follows. What if everything, including your memories and all the evidence of the past, came into existence last Thursday? The idea is designed to highlight the philosophical problems of induction, the reasoning process that leads us to make generalizations based on past experiences. From a philosophical standpoint, last Thursdayism invites us to question the foundations of our beliefs and the reliability of our senses. If the universe and our memories were created recently, it challenges our ability to trust in the continuity of experience and the assumption that the past is a reliable guide to understanding the present. While Last Thursdayism is often used as a light-hearted and somewhat absurd example in discussions about epistemology, the study of knowledge, it underscores the broader philosophical challenges related to the nature of reality, the reliability of perception, and the justification of our beliefs about the past. The Veil of Ignorance The Veil of Ignorance is a concept introduced by the political philosopher John Rawls in his influential work, A Theory of Justice. The idea is a key component of Rawls' theory of justice, which seeks to establish principles for the fair distribution of social goods within a just society. The Veil of Ignorance is a hypothetical device that Rawls asks individuals to imagine themselves behind when designing the principles of justice. In this thought experiment, individuals are placed in an original position before the establishment of social institutions and norms. Crucially, these individuals are unaware of their own personal characteristics, such as their gender, race, social status, talents, or abilities. They are essentially veiled in ignorance about their own circumstances. The purpose of the Veil of Ignorance is to encourage fair and impartial decision-making. Rawls argues that by not knowing one's own specific characteristics, individuals are more likely to adopt principles of justice that are unbiased and impartial. In this hypothetical state, individuals would be motivated to create a just society that considers the interests and well-being of all, as they could end up in any position within that society once the veil is lifted. The veil of ignorance serves as a moral and ethical framework for elevating societal structures, policies, and distributions of resources. It challenges individuals to think about justice from a position of fairness 
without knowing their own personal advantages or disadvantages. Rawls' theory, including the concept of the veil of ignorance, has had a significant impact on discussions about social justice and has influenced political philosophy and policy making. The Trilemma of Omniscience The Trilemma of Omniscience is a philosophical challenge that arises in discussions about the nature of God's omniscience. It presents a set of three seemingly contradictory statements, highlighting the tension between divine foreknowledge, human free will, and the existence of future contingencies. The trilemma is often formulated as follows. God is omniscient and knows the future. Humans have free will and can make choices. There are future contingencies, events whose outcomes are not determined. The challenge arises from the apparent conflict between God's omniscience and the existence of genuine human free will. If God knows the future with certainty, including our future choices, it seems to undermine the notion of true human freedom. On the other hand, if humans have genuine free will and can make choices that are not predetermined, it appears to limit God's omniscience. Philosophers and theologians have explored various responses to the trilemma of omniscience. Some propose solutions that involve redefining the nature of divine foreknowledge, suggesting that God's knowledge of the future is compatible with human free will. Others explore the concept of middle knowledge, a type of knowledge that God possesses about what free creatures would do in various circumstances, allowing for both divine foreknowledge and human freedom. The trilemma engages with a profound question about the nature of God, the limits of human agency, and the compatibility of divine attributes. It has been a topic of discussion in both philosophical theology and the philosophy of religion, prompting reflections on the nature of time, causality, and the relationship between God and created beings. The Doctrine of Eternal Recurrence The doctrine of eternal recurrence is a philosophical concept that proposes the idea that all events and experiences in the universe, including our lives, are destined to recur repeatedly for an infinite number of times. This notion challenges conventional views of time, fate, and the nature of existence. The concept has been explored by various philosophers throughout history and is often associated with the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche introduced the idea of eternal recurrence in his work Thus Spoke Zarathustra. According to his doctrine, if the universe is infinite in both time and space, and if the number of possible states is finite, then every possible configuration of matter and energy will eventually repeat in the exact same way. This includes not only the physical events in the universe, but also the individual lives and choices of every person. The implications of the doctrine of eternal recurrence are profound. It suggests that every joy, pain, success, and failure in our lives will be experienced again and again in an unending cycle. Nietzsche framed this concept as a test of the individual's affirmation of life. If one were to live their life as if they had to relive it infinitely, every action and choice would carry tremendous weight and significance. The doctrine of eternal recurrence has been met with various responses. Some philosophers see it as a provocative thought experiment that challenges individuals to live authentically and ethically, considering the consequences of their actions in an eternal perspective. Others find it to be a metaphysical speculation without empirical basis, raising questions about the nature of time, determinism, and the feasibility of such a recurrence. The Philosophy of Futility The philosophy of futility is a perspective that reflects on the apparent meaninglessness, purposelessness, or hopelessness of certain aspects of life or existence. This philosophical stance often arises in the face of perceived challenges to finding purpose, achieving meaningful goals, or deriving enduring value from certain endeavors. From an existential standpoint, the philosophy of futility acknowledges the inherent struggle in seeking meaning or purpose in a seemingly indifferent or chaotic universe. It may be influenced by the experiences of disillusionment, existential angst, or a recognition of the impermanence of human achievements. 
Some individuals adopt this perspective when confronting the limits of human knowledge, the inevitability of death, or the cyclical nature of certain human endeavors. Existential thinkers, such as Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, have explored themes related to the apparent futility of human existence. Camus, in particular, discussed the concept of the absurd, the inherent conflict between humans' desire for meaning and a seemingly indifferent universe. The philosophy of futility can manifest in various areas of life, including personal relationships, career pursuits, or broader societal concerns. It often prompts individuals to question traditional notions of success, happiness, or progress that may lead to a sense of nihilism, where one perceives a lack of inherent value in the universe. While the philosophy of futility emphasizes the challenges of finding meaning, purpose, or lasting significance, different philosophical perspectives offer alternative views. Existentialists, for example, argue that individuals have the freedom to create their own meaning and values in the face of existential challenges. Other philosophies explore notions of interconnectedness, virtue, or spiritual dimensions as potential sources of meaning. The absence of free will. This basically refers to determinism that we discussed before, that individuals do not have the capacity to make choices independent of external influences. The Omnipotence Paradox. The Omnipotence Paradox is a thought experiment that probes the logical coherence of the concept of omnipotence, particularly as it relates to a deity often conceptualized as God. The paradox is framed through a seemingly straightforward question, can an omnipotent being create a rock so heavy that even it cannot lift? This paradox introduces a tension between the traditional attributes associated with an all-powerful being. If the omnipotent being can create such a rock, it appears to encounter a limit to its power, the inability to lift the rock it created. On the other hand, if the omnipotent being cannot create a rock of such weight, it raises the question about the extent of its omnipotence. One avenue of response involves rejecting the idea that omnipotence entails the ability to perform logically contradictory actions. In this view, the question itself is considered illogical, akin to asking whether an omnipotent being can make a square circle. This response seeks to redefine omnipotence as the ability to do anything that is logically possible, excluding actions that inherently involve logical contradictions. Another response involves the reinterpretation of the concept of omnipotence. Some argue that omnipotence should not be understood as the ability to perform any conceivable action, but rather as the ability to do anything consistent with the nature and attributes of the divine being. This perspective introduces limitations on divine action while preserving the idea of omnipotence within a specific framework. The Philosophy of Nothingness The Philosophy of Nothingness is a philosophical inquiry that explores the nature and implications of nothingness, void, or emptiness. This theme has been addressed by thinkers across various philosophical traditions, encompassing existentialism, Eastern philosophy, and nihilism. The exploration of nothingness delves into the question about existence, meaning, and the nature of reality. Existentialist philosophers, such as Jean-Paul Sartre, engaged with the concept of nothingness in the context of human existence. Sartre, in particular, emphasized human freedom and the experience of being for itself, arguing that individuals confront a kind of existential nothingness or lack that defines their freedom to create meaning through their choices. The experience of nothingness, in this context, is intertwined with the human capacity for radical freedom and responsibility. In Eastern philosophy, particularly in Buddhist thought, the concept of emptiness, sunyata, plays a significant role. Emptiness is not a mere absence, but a profound insight into the interdependence and impermanence of all phenomena. It is a way of understanding the nature of reality beyond conventional dualities and conceptual limitations. In this perspective, 
embracing nothingness is a path to liberation and enlightenment. Nihilism, on the other hand, takes a more skeptical and often pessimistic stance towards nothingness. Nihilism contends that life lacks inherent meaning or value, and concepts like morality or purpose are ultimately groundless. Some philosophers, such as Friedrich Nietzsche, critique nihilism while also grappling with the consequences of living in a world that appears devoid of inherent meaning. The philosophy of nothingness raises fundamental questions about the nature of existence, the significance of human life, and the role of consciousness in shaping reality. It challenges conventional assumptions and prompts individuals to confront the existential void, asking whether meaning can be found in the absence of inherent purpose, or, if instead, humans must actively create their own meaning in a seemingly indifferent universe. The Trolley Problem The Trolley Problem is a thought experiment in ethics and moral philosophy that presents a moral dilemma involving a choice between two morally conflicting actions. The scenario is often described as follows. A runaway trolley is headed towards five people who are tied to a track and cannot move. You are standing next to a lever that controls a switch. If you pull the lever, the trolley will be diverted to another track, saving the five people. However, there is one person tied to the other track who will be hit and likely killed if you divert the trolley. The dilemma forces individuals to consider the ethical implications of their actions and grapple with questions of utilitarianism, consequentialism, and deontology. Different variations of the trolley problem may involve alternating the number of people on each track, changing the relationship between the decision-maker and the individuals involved, or introducing other elements to complicate the ethical calculus. Responses to the trolley problem vary, reflecting different ethical theories and moral intuitions. Some individuals may lean towards a utilitarian perspective, arguing that the morally right action is the one that maximizes overall well-being. In this case, diverting the trolley to save the five lives at the expense of one might be seen as ethically justifiable. Others may approach the problem from a deontological standpoint, emphasizing principles and duties. From this perspective, intentionally causing harm, even to avert a greater harm, may be considered morally unacceptable. The uncertainty principle is a fundamental concept in quantum mechanics, a branch of physics that deals with the behavior of matter and energy on very small scales, such as the scale of atoms and subatomic particles. The principle was formulated by German physicist Werner Heisenberg in 1927 and is a cornerstone of quantum theory. The uncertainty principle asserts that there are inherent limits to the precision with which certain pairs of properties, such as position and momentum, can be simultaneously known. Specifically, the more accurately we know the position of a particle, the less accurately we know its momentum, and vice versa. This is not due to limitations in measurement devices, but it is a fundamental aspect of the nature of quantum systems. The uncertainty principle challenges classical intuition because it implies an inherent interdeterminacy at the quantum level. It suggests that certain pairs of complementary properties, such as position and momentum, cannot simultaneously possess precise, well-defined values. This indeterminacy is not due to limitations in our measurement tools, but it is a fundamental feature of the quantum world. The Bicameral Mind the bicameral mind refers to a theory proposed by psychologist and author Gillian Jaynes in his 1976 book The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Jaynes suggests a hypothesis about the nature of human consciousness and how it might have evolved. According to Jaynes, early humans may have had a different kind of consciousness than contemporary humans. He proposes that, in ancient times, people did not have the fully developed sense of individual self-awareness. Instead, he suggests that their minds were divided into two chambers, or bicameral states. In this state, one part of the mind, the bicameral mind, would issue commands or instructions, 
and the other part would receive and obey those commands without the individual being consciously aware of making the decision. Jaynes argued that the bicameral mind gave rise to what people interpreted as the voices of gods or divine entities. Individuals, according to his theory, would hear the internal voices as a form of guidance, and they would follow the instructions without being consciously aware that the commands originated from within their own minds. The transition from this bicameral mind to the more introspective and self-aware consciousness that we experience today, according to Jaynes, occurred over time through cultural, social, and neurological changes. This theory has been met with a fair amount of skepticism and criticism within the academic community, and it is not widely accepted as a mainstream explanation for the evolution of human consciousness. Nonetheless, the bicameral mind remains an intriguing and influential idea in the fields of psychology and philosophy of mind. The Butterfly Effect The butterfly effect is a concept that originated in chaos theory and is often used to illustrate the sensitivity of complex systems to initial conditions. The idea is that a small change in one part of the system can have far-reaching consequences throughout the system. The term butterfly effect itself is often associated with the notion that the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil could set off a chain of events that led to a tornado in Texas. The butterfly effect is commonly used to explain the unpredictable and nonlinear nature of certain systems, particularly in the context of weather patterns and atmospheric conditions. The basic premise is that even tiny perturbations in the initial state of a system can lead to dramatically different outcomes over time. The concept became popular outside of scientific circles through the work of mathematician and meteorologist Edward Lorenz. In a 1972 paper titled Predictability, Does the Flap of a Butterfly's Wings in Brazil Set Off a Tornado in Texas? Lorenz used the butterfly effect to highlight the challenges of long-term weather prediction. The Allegory of the Cave the allegory of the cave is a philosophical concept presented by the ancient Greek philosopher Plato in Book 7 of his work, The Republic. It is a symbolic story that aims to illustrate the nature of human perception, knowledge, and enlightenment. The allegory is often considered one of Plato's most famous and enduring ideas. In the allegory of the cave, Plato describes a group of prisoners who have been chained inside a dark cave for their entire lives. These prisoners are facing the wall of the cave and are unable to turn their heads. Behind them is a fire, and between the prisoners and the fire is a raised walkway. Objects and figures pass in front of the fire, casting shadows on the cave wall that the prisoners can see. The prisoners, having never seen the outside world or the objects causing the shadows, mistake the shadows for reality and believe them to be the only truth. One day, a prisoner is freed and exposed to the outside world. Initially, he is blinded by the sunlight and disoriented by the real world, but gradually he begins the true nature of reality. He realizes that the shadows in the cave were mere illusions, and he gains knowledge of the external world. The allegory of the cave is a metaphor for the journey of enlightenment and the philosopher's quest for knowledge. The cave symbolizes the world of appearances and illusions, while the outside world represents the world of true knowledge and forms. The journey of the freed prisoner represents the philosopher's progression from ignorance to wisdom. Plato uses this allegory to convey his views on the nature of reality, the role of education in enlightenment, and the philosopher's responsibility to return to the cave to help free others. It remains a powerful and enduring metaphor in Western philosophy, prompting reflection on the nature of perception, reality, and the pursuit of knowledge. The Fermi Paradox The Fermi Paradox is a fascinating and perplexing question that arises from the apparent discrepancy between the high likelihood of extraterrestrial civilizations existing in our vast universe and the lack of any conclusive evidence or contact with such civilizations. Enrico Fermi, a physicist, famously pondered the absence of observable signs of extraterrestrial life and succinctly asked, Where is everybody? 
The paradox hinges on the sheer number of stars in our galaxy, many of which are similar to our Sun and likely host Earth-like planets. With the immense age of the universe and the potential for intelligent life to emerge, one would expect numerous opportunities for contact or evidence of extraterrestrial civilizations. Yet as of now, our search for extraterrestrial intelligence has yielded no definitive results. One proposed solution to the Fermi paradox is the rare Earth hypothesis, suggesting that the conditions necessary for complex life, particularly intelligent life, are exceedingly rare. Earth's specific combination of factors, including a stable environment and suitable climate, may be more unique than previously thought. This perspective posits that while the universe may be teeming with simple life forms, the emergence of intelligent life capable of technological advancement is a highly improbable event. Another compelling concept tied to the Fermi paradox is the Great Filter Hypothesis. This theoretical framework suggests that there are formidable obstacles or hurdles, referred to as the Great Filter, that make it exceptionally challenging for life to progress from simple to complex forms or for intelligent civilizations to endure over long periods. If the Great Filter lies ahead of us in our evolutionary timeline, it could explain why we have not yet observed widespread signs of extraterrestrial life. Additionally, the possibility of technological stagnation or self-destruction among advanced civilizations offers another explanation. Some argue that advanced societies may reach a point where technological progress plateaus, preventing them from exploring space or making their presence known. Alternatively, self-destructive tendencies, whether through environmental degradation, warfare, or other factors, might lead to the decline or extinction of intelligent civilizations. The Paradox of Tolerance The Paradox of Tolerance is a philosophical concept that explores the tension between the idea of promoting a tolerant society and the need to address and limit the tolerance of intolerant views. The concept is associated with the philosopher Karl Popper, who discussed it in his work The Open Society and Its Enemies. The paradox arises from the dilemma that if a society is entirely tolerant without limits, it may end up being destroyed by the intolerant forces it harbors. In other words, if a tolerant society allows the unrestricted growth of intolerant ideologies or individuals, those intolerant elements could undermine the very foundations of the tolerant society. Popper argued that for a society to remain tolerant and open, it must be willing to limit the tolerance it extends to those who would exploit that tolerance to promote intolerant and oppressive ideologies. He refers to this as the paradox of tolerance. In order to maintain a tolerant society, one must be intolerant of those who would seek to undermine tolerance itself. This concept has significant implications for discussions around free speech, hate speech, and the limits of tolerating diverse opinions. It prompts questions about how a society should navigate the balance between protecting freedom of expression and preventing the rise of ideologies that, if given free reign, could lead to the suppression of that very freedom. In practice, the paradox of tolerance underscores the importance of discernment and critical thinking in a democratic society. It suggests that there are limits to tolerance and that society must actively engage in the defense of democratic values and individual rights while being mindful of the potential consequences of unfettered tolerance for intolerant ideologies. Ultimately, it is a call for thoughtful consideration on how to strike a balance between openness and safeguarding the principles that sustain a free and tolerant society. The Veil of Maya The term Veil of Maya has its roots in Indian philosophy, particularly within the context of Hinduism and Vedanta. The concept is associated with the idea that the material world, as perceived by our senses, is an illusion or a veil that hides the true nature of reality. In Hindu philosophy, Maya is often understood as the cosmic illusion that veils the ultimate reality, Brahman. The term veil emphasizes the deceptive nature of the phenomenal world. According to this perspective, 
Individuals are often deluded by the appearance of the material world, mistaking it for ultimate reality. The concept is often used metaphorically to describe the way in which people are entangled in the material world, captivated by their sensory experiences and perceptions. The goal of spiritual practice, according to Vedanta and other related philosophies, is to pierce through this veil of maya and attain true knowledge, janana, and realization of the underlying, unchanging reality, Brahman. The idea of the veil of maya has also been influential in the broader context of philosophical and spiritual discussions, transcending its roots in Hindu philosophy. It resonates with themes found in various religions and philosophical traditions that explore the illusory nature of the material world and the quest for deeper, transcendent truths. In Western philosophy, the concept has been discussed and adapted by thinkers who were influenced by Eastern thought or sought to integrate Eastern and Western philosophical perspectives. It has become a point of reference in discussions about the nature of reality, perception, and the human experience. Overall, the Veil of Maya serves as a symbolic and metaphorical concept that encourages reflection on the nature of existence, consciousness, and the pursuit of higher knowledge. The Problem of Induction The problem of induction is a philosophical challenge that questions the justification and reliability of inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning involves making generalizations or predictions based on observed patterns or past experiences. Unlike deductive reasoning, which involves deriving specific conclusions from general principles, inductive reasoning moves from specific observations to general conclusions. The problem was famously articulated by the Scottish philosopher David Hume in the 18th century. Hume observed that inductive reasoning relies on the assumption that the future will resemble the past. For example, if we observe the sun rising every morning, we may infer that the sun will rise tomorrow. However, Hume pointed out that this inference is not logically certain, as there is no logical necessity that the future will resemble the past. Hume's critique highlights the fundamental challenge of induction. It lacks a rational basis for justifying its key assumption. The past may not be a reliable guide to the future, and there is no logical necessity that patterns observed in the past will continue in the same way. This raises doubts about the epistic legitimacy of inductive reasoning. Various attempts have been made to address or respond to the problem of induction. One notable response comes from the philosopher Karl Popper, who argued for the principle of falsifiability. Popper suggested that scientific theories should be formulated in a way that allows for the possibility of being falsified or disproven by empirical evidence. According to Popper, while we cannot establish the truth of a theory through induction, we can potentially falsify it, and the willingness to subject theories to empirical testing distinguishes scientific reasoning. The Chinese Room Argument The Chinese Room Argument is a thought experiment and philosophical argument presented by John Searle in 1980. It is designed to challenge the idea that a computer program, even if it appears to understand and process language, can truly possess consciousness or understanding. The thought experiment involves a person, referred to as the man in the Chinese room, who does not understand Chinese but is given a set of instructions written in English for manipulating Chinese symbols. The person inside the room receives the Chinese symbols as input, follows the instructions to manipulate these symbols, and produces Chinese symbols as output. From the outside, to a Chinese speaker, it might seem like the person inside the room understands Chinese because they are generating appropriate responses. However, the person inside the room claims not to understand Chinese. They are merely following syntactic rules without comprehending the meaning of the symbols. Searle's argument is intended to demonstrate that mere syntactic manipulation of symbols, as performed by a computer program, does not equate to genuine understanding or consciousness. According to Searle, Understanding requires more than the manipulation of symbols. It requires a subjective awareness or consciousness of the meaning of those symbols. The Chinese Room Argument challenges the claims of proponents of strong artificial intelligence, who argue that sufficiently advanced computer programs could exhibit true understanding and consciousness. 
Searle contends that even if a computer program passes the Turing test, convincingly simulating human conversation, it does not necessarily imply understanding or consciousness. The argument raises questions about the nature of consciousness, the limits of artificial intelligence, and the role of subjective experience in understanding. The Uncanny Valley the Uncanny Valley is a concept in the field of robotics and human-computer interaction that describes the eerie or unsettling feeling people experience when confronted with a robot or animated character that closely resembles a human but still exhibits subtle imperfections or lacks certain human-like qualities. The term Uncanny Valley was coined by Japanese roboticist Masahiro Mori in 1970. The idea is often represented graphically as a valley in a chart, where the x-axis represents the degree of human likeness and the y-axis represents the emotional response or comfort level of humans. According to Mori's hypothesis, as a robot or character becomes increasingly human-like, there is a corresponding increase in the viewer's emotional response and affinity up to a certain point. However, when the entity becomes almost but not quite indistinguishable from a human, the emotional response drops sharply into a valley, before rising again for entities that are indistinguishably human. In this uncanny valley, the subtle deviations from human norms or the presence of artificial features create a sense of unease or discomfort. This dip in the emotional response is thought to occur because the human brain is very sensitive to deviations from the expected appearance and behavior of other humans. The uncanny valley phenomenon is often discussed in the context of robotics, computer-generated characters in movies and video games, and virtual reality. Designers and engineers strive to create robots or avatars that are both lifelike and emotionally engaging without triggering negative emotional reactions. Achieving a balance that avoids the uncanny valley is considered crucial in creating believable and relatable human-like entities in various technological applications. The Doppelganger Paradox The term doppelganger refers to a look-alike or double of a person, often portrayed as an uncanny or sometimes supernatural phenomenon. The Doppelganger Paradox is not a widely recognized term in philosophy, but it can be used to describe a conceptual paradox related to the idea of identical or nearly identical duplicates. The paradox arises from the tension between the uniqueness of individual identity and the possibility of exact duplicates. If we imagine a scenario where two individuals are identical in every way, physically, mentally, and experientially, then the question arises, can they truly be considered separate individuals or are they essentially the same person? On one hand, if the duplicates are truly identical, it challenges the notion of individuality and uniqueness. If all aspects of their being are the same, it becomes difficult to distinguish one from the other, raising questions about personal identity and what it means to be an individual. On the other hand, if we consider them as distinct individuals, there must be some criterion or difference that allows us to distinguish between them. However, if they are truly identical, finding such a criterion becomes problematic. This paradox touches on philosophical questions related to personal identity, consciousness, and the nature of individuality. It is reminiscent of classic thought experiments like John Locke's discussion of personal identity where he explores the continuity of consciousness over time. The Experience Machine The Experience Machine is a thought experiment in philosophy that was proposed by Robert Nozick in his book Anarchy, State, and Utopia, published in 1974. The experiment is designed to explore the nature of happiness, well-being, and the value of authentic experiences. The scenario presented by The Experience Machine is as follows. Imagine there is a machine that can provide you with any experience you desire. You can plug into this machine and it will stimulate your brain and give you the sensation of living a life filled with positive and pleasurable experiences. The experiences can be as rich, varied, and fulfilling as you wish, and they would feel indistinguishable from real life. Nozick poses the question, 
would you choose to permanently plug into the experience machine, forsaking the real world for a simulated life of constant pleasure and satisfaction? The thought experiment is intended to challenge hedonistic or utilitarian views of well-being that prioritize pleasure or happiness as the ultimate goal. If one were to reject plugging into the machine, it suggests that there is no more to the value of life than simply the pursuit of pleasure. Nozick argues that people value not just the subjective experience of happiness, but also the reality of achieving certain things, making choices, and engaging in authentic relationships. The experience machine raises questions about the importance of authenticity, personal agency, and the pursuit of objective goods in human lives. If individuals prefer real experiences over simulated ones, it implies that there is an intrinsic value in the genuine, unmediated engagement with the world, even if it comes with challenges and hardships. The Great Filter The Great Filter is a speculative concept in astrobiology that seeks to address the apparent scarcity of observable extraterrestrial civilizations in the universe. Proposed as a potential solution to the Fermi paradox, the Great Filter hypothesis posits that there exists a critical and challenging step in the evolution of life that very few civilizations successfully navigate. This step, referred to as the Filter, dramatically reduces the number of civilizations that reach the advanced technological stage capable of interstellar communication and exploration. The Great Filter can be either positioned in the past, suggesting that the emergence of complex life or intelligent civilizations is rare, or in the future, signaling potential existential threats that technological civilizations may face. If the filter is in the past, it implies that simple life may be common, but the development of intelligent, technologically advanced civilizations is rare. If in the future, it raises concerns about the challenges humanity might encounter as it continues to advance technologically. The concept prompts contemplation on the nature of life's evolution and the potential hurdles that may limit the proliferation of intelligent civilizations. If the Great Filter lies in our past, it sheds light on the unique trajectory that led to Earth's complex life. If it lies in our future, it poses a sobering question about the risks and responsibilities associated with our technological advancements. The Great Filter Hypothesis underscores the uncertainties surrounding the likelihood of extraterrestrial intelligence and encourages a critical examination of the factors that may shape the fate of civilizations across the cosmos. The Ticking Time Bomb Scenario the ticking time bomb scenario is a moral and ethical thought experiment often used in discussions surrounding torture and interrogations. It presents a hypothetical situation in which an individual possesses critical information that could save lives, but time is of the essence, and traditional interrogation methods have failed. In this scenario, a bomb is set to explode, and the only known way to prevent the catastrophe is by extracting information from the person who knows the bomb's location and disarmament procedures. The ethical dilemma arises when considering whether it is justifiable to use torture as a means of extracting information in order to prevent a greater harm. Advocates argue that in extreme situations where lives are at immediate risk, utilitarian considerations may justify the use of torture as a last resort. They contend that the greater good of saving innocent lives may outweigh the ethical concerns associated with torture. Opponents of torture, however, argue that it is a fundamental violation of human rights and dignity. They assert that torture is ineffective, as individuals subjected to extreme pain may provide false information simply to end their suffering. Moreover, they contend that the use of torture undermines moral principles and sets a dangerous precedent, potentially leading to the erosion of ethical standards in society. The ticking time bomb scenario is not merely an abstract philosophical exercise. It has practical implications for legal and policy decisions. The debate around this scenario reflects broader decisions on the balance between security and human rights, the efficacy of torture as an interrogation method, 
and the ethical limits that should be placed on the actions of individuals and governments in the pursuit of justice and safety. The Philosophy of Deconstruction Deconstruction is a philosophical approach that originated within the works of French philosopher Jacques Derrida in the mid-20th century. It is associated with post-structuralist thought and challenges traditional notions of language, meaning, and interpretation. Deconstruction seeks to reveal and destabilize the assumptions and hierarchies embedded in texts and discourses. At its core, Deconstruction questions the idea that language can accurately and transparently represent reality. Derrida argued that language is inherently unstable and that words gain their meaning through a system of differences and contrasts rather than fixed definitions. According to deconstruction, there is no ultimate foundation or fixed point of reference in language that can guarantee a stable and objective meaning. One of the key concepts in deconstruction is deference, a term that combines difference and deferral. Deference emphasizes the play of differences within languages and suggests that meaning is always deferred, continually shifting and never fully present. Derrida argued that traditional Western philosophy often relies on binary oppositions, such as presence-absence, speech-writing, or reality appearance. Deconstruction seeks to expose and disrupt these binary hierarchies, revealing the interconnected and fluid nature of language. Deconstruction does not aim to dismantle or negate texts, but rather to demonstrate the inherent complexity and ambiguity within them. It involves close readings that highlight contradictions, paradoxes, and the ways in which language undermines itself. Deconstruction challenges the idea of a stable and fixed meaning, encouraging readers to recognize the multiplicity of interpretations and to be attentive to the nuances and complexities within texts. The Tragedy of the Commons The Tragedy of the Commons is a concept in economics and environmental science that was popularized by Garrett Hardin in a famous 1968 essay of the same name. The tragedy arises from the exploitation and depletion of shared resources, particularly when individuals, acting in their own self-interest, deplete or degrade a commonly held resource. The scenario is often illustrated with the metaphor of a common pasture, accessible to all herders. Each herder has the incentive to maximize their individual gain by adding more cattle to graze. However, as each herder pursues this strategy, the pasture becomes overgrazed, leading to the degradation of the resource. In the end, all herders suffer as the pasture is no longer able to support their collective needs. The tragedy of the commons highlights the tension between individual self-interest and the common good. When resources are shared and unregulated, individuals have an incentive to exploit them to their advantage, leading to overuse and depletion. This concept has broader applications beyond pastures and can be extended to various shared resources like fisheries, air and water quality, and even global issues such as climate change. Solutions to the tragedy of the commons often involve some form of collective action, regulation, or the establishment of property rights. By creating rules and institutions that govern the use of shared resources, Societies can mitigate the risk of overexploitation and ensure the sustainable management of common goods. The Stockholm Syndrome The Stockholm Syndrome, named after a 1973 bank robbery incident in Stockholm, Sweden, is a psychological phenomenon that perplexingly involves hostages forming emotional connections with their captors. During the six-day ordeal, some hostages developed unexpected feelings of empathy, trust, and even loyalty towards those who had subjected them to captivity. This counterintuitive bond has been attributed to various psychological and emotional factors. One explanation suggests that it could be a survival mechanism, where victims unconsciously seek to connect with their captors as a means of improving their chances of survival. In adopting this strategy, Hostages may perceive a reduction in the perceived threat and an increased likelihood of favorable treatment. Another perspective views the Stockholm Syndrome as a coping mechanism. 
a psychological defense strategy to deal with the overwhelming stress and trauma associated with a hostage situation. Victims may form a bond with their captors to make sense of the distressing experience. Additionally, the perceived kindness or occasional acts of mercy by captors may contribute to positive feelings, fostering a connection between captor and captive. Power dynamics also play a role as victims, feeling a lack of control, may identify with their captors as a way of adapting to their circumstances. While the Stockholm Syndrome is a recognized phenomenon, it does not universally manifest in all hostage situations, and its occurrence highlights the intricate nature of human psychological responses to extreme stress and trauma. The syndrome extends beyond hostage scenarios, manifesting in abusive relationships, cults, and situations where individuals unexpectedly form emotional bonds with those who hold power or control. The Uncanny The concept of the uncanny, or unheimlich in German, has been a subject of exploration in both philosophy and literature. Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, delved into the uncanny in his essay, The Uncanny, 1919, where he sought to understand the feelings of discomfort and eeriness associated with certain experiences. The uncanny is often described as a sense of something familiar yet strange, creating a feeling of unease or discomfort. Freud identified several elements contributing to the uncanny, including the return of the repressed, the repetition of the same, and the ambiguity between what is alive and what is not. In literature and art, the uncanny often manifests through themes such as doppelgangers, dolls, automatons, and the supernatural. Characters or situations that appear both familiar and unfamiliar evoke a sense of the uncanny. For instance, encountering a lifelike robot or seeing one's own double might trigger this eerie sensation. Philosophers and literary theorists beyond Freud have explored the uncanny as well. Martin Heidegger, for instance, examined the concept of uncanniness as a way of disclosing the hidden and unsettling aspects of existence. Jacques Derrida, a postmodern philosopher, engaged with the uncanny in his deconstructive approach, unraveling the hidden complexities and contradictions within language and meaning. The Eternal Feminine The Eternal Feminine is a concept with historical and cultural significance often associated with the representation of femininity in art, literature, and philosophy. One notable reference to the eternal feminine can be found in Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's Faust, particularly in the second part of the play. In Faust Part Two, the character Faust encounters a celestial figure known as the eternal feminine. This figure is associated with the redemptive and transformative qualities of feminine energy. The concept represents an idealized and eternal form of femininity that transcends individual women and encompasses archetypal qualities such as beauty, wisdom, and nurturing. In this context, the eternal feminine is a symbol of the redemptive and creative forces that can elevate humanity. The concept has also been explored by philosophers and thinkers beyond Goethe. In Friedrich Nietzsche's work, the eternal feminine is associated with the idea of a transcendent, life-affirming force that counterbalances the destructive aspects of existence. Nietzsche views the eternal feminine as a source of inspiration and creativity. In contemporary discussions, the concept of the eternal feminine has been critiqued for its potential to essentialize and stereotype women. Critics argue that reducing femininity to a fixed eternal essence can reinforce traditional gender norms and limit the diversity of women's experiences. The Theory of Mind The Theory of Mind, T-O-M, is a concept in psychological and cognitive science that refers to the ability to attribute mental states, such as thoughts, beliefs, intentions, and desires, to oneself and others. It involves recognizing that individuals have their own perspectives, knowledge, and feelings, which may differ from one's own. The development of a theory of mind is considered a crucial aspect of social cognition and interpersonal understanding. In childhood development, the acquisition of a theory of mind 
is a significant milestone. Young children gradually develop the ability to understand that others can have beliefs and knowledge distinct from their own. This cognitive skill enables individuals to interpret and predict the behavior of others based on their mental states. For example, a child with a developed theory of mind can understand that a friend may be looking for a hidden object based on the friend's belief about its location. The theory of mind is not only relevant to child development, but is also crucial for navigating complex social interactions and relationships in adulthood. It plays a role in empathy, cooperation, communication, and the ability to engage in perspective taking. Individuals with well-developed theory of mind skills are often more adept at understanding social cues, interpreting others' emotions, and navigating the intricacies of human interaction. In psychology and neuroscience, researchers study the neurological and cognitive processes underlying the theory of mind. Conditions such as autism spectrum disorders are associated with challenges in developing a fully mature theory of mind, highlighting the importance of this cognitive ability in social functioning. The Ouroboros The Ouroboros, a symbolic representation of a serpent or dragon consuming its own tail to form a continuous circle, has deep historical roots and multifaceted meanings across various cultures and intellectual traditions. Emblematic of cyclical and eternal recurrence, the Ouroboros is often interpreted as a visual metaphor for the perpetual cycle of life, death, and rebirth. This symbolism transcends cultural boundaries, with the serpent's act of self-consumption serving as a powerful representation of the interconnectedness of all things. In addition to its association with cyclicality, the Ouroboros is often linked to the reconciliation of opposites. By encapsulating both the beginning and the end within the same circular motif, the symbol signifies the unity of dualities such as creation and destruction, light and dark, or order and chaos. This theme resonates with philosophical concepts highlighting the essential interdependence of seemingly contradictory forces. Alchemy, a mystical and philosophical tradition with roots in the ancient world, has also embraced the Ouroboros. In alchemical symbolism, the serpent eating its tail is frequently associated with the idea of the Philosopher's Stone, a mythical substance believed to have transformative powers, capable of transmuting base metals into gold, and imparting immortality. The Ouroboros, in this context, serves as a visual representation of the alchemical journey toward enlightenment, transmutation, and spiritual rebirth. The Gaia Hypothesis The Gaia Hypothesis, proposed by scientist James Lovelock in the 1970s, is a concept in environmental science and ecology that suggests the Earth functions as a self-regulating, living organism. Named after the Greek goddess Gaia, who personifies the Earth, the hypothesis views the planet as a complex system where living organisms interact with the environment to maintain conditions suitable for life. The core idea of the Gaia hypothesis is that Earth's biota, the sum total of all living organisms, and the physical environment are tightly interconnected, forming a self-regulating system. This system has mechanisms that help stabilize and optimize environmental conditions such as temperature, atmospheric composition, and ocean salinity to support life. One of the central concepts within the Gaia hypothesis is the idea of feedback loops. These feedback loops involve interactions between living organisms and the environment that either amplify or dampen changes. For example, if temperatures rise, certain feedback mechanisms might come into play to cool the planet, or, if atmospheric oxygen levels decrease, mechanisms might act to increase oxygen production. Critics of the Gaia hypothesis have sometimes misunderstood it as proposing that the Earth and its ecosystems have a conscious or purposeful intent. Lovelock himself has clarified that he used the term Gaia more as a metaphor than a literal description of the Earth as a sentient being. Instead, the hypothesis suggests 
that the emergent properties of interactions between living organisms and the environment contribute to the overall stability of the Earth's conditions. The Observer Effect The observer effect is a concept that originates in physics and is associated with the idea that the act of observation can influence or alter the behavior of the thing being observed. This principle is particularly prominent in quantum mechanics, where the mere act of measuring or observing a quantum state is believed to impact its state. In quantum physics, particles can exist in multiple states simultaneously until measured, at which point they collapse into one of the possible states. This phenomenon is often illustrated by the famous thought experiment known as Schrodinger's cat. The act of observation or measurement, according to quantum theory, is not a passive process but an active interaction that affects the outcome. Beyond the realm of quantum mechanics, the observer effect has been considered in various scientific and philosophical contexts. In psychology and sociology, for example, the presence of an observer can influence human behavior, a phenomenon known as the Hawthorne effect. In social sciences, the awareness of being observed can lead to changes in individuals' behavior, affecting the reliability of observational studies. The observer effect also has implications in philosophy, particularly in discussions about the nature of reality and the role of consciousness. Some philosophical interpretations suggest that observation and consciousness play a fundamental role in shaping or defining reality. While the observer effect remains a crucial consideration in quantum physics and has broad implications across different disciplines, it is essential to note that the nature and extent of the effect are topics of ongoing debate and exploration. The concept challenges traditional notions of objectivity and raises questions about the dynamic relationship between the observer and the observed in various scientific and philosophical inquiries. The God of the Gaps The God of the Gaps is a term used to describe a type of argument in which God or a divine being is invoked to explain phenomena or gaps in scientific understanding that are not currently explained by natural laws or processes. This argumentation is often criticized as an attempt to insert a supernatural explanation into areas where scientific knowledge is incomplete or lacking. The term is closely associated with the history of science and the interplay between scientific and religious explanations. When there are gaps in scientific understanding, proponents of the God of the Gaps argument may assert that God or a higher power is the explanation for those gaps. However, as scientific knowledge advances and fills in those gaps, the space for a divine explanation diminishes. The God of the Gaps argument is criticized on several fronts. One key critique is that it is based on an argument from ignorance, asserting that because science cannot currently explain a phenomenon, it must be the work of a higher power. This approach is considered problematic because it doesn't offer positive evidence for the existence of God and relies on gaps in knowledge that may be temporary. Prominent examples of historical God of the Gaps arguments include attributing lightning to the anger of gods before the understanding of atmospheric processes, or explaining biological complexity as evidence for a divine creator before the development of evolutionary theory. The Ship in a Storm Analogy The ship in a storm analogy is a poignant metaphor often employed to delve into the intricacies of personal identity and the challenges inherent in navigating the tumultuous sea of existence. In this analogy, the ship serves as a symbolic representation of the individual, while the storm embodies the myriad challenges, adversities, and uncertainties encountered throughout one's life. It speaks to the universal human experience of grappling with difficulties, whether they be personal struggles, external pressures, or existential crises. As the ship faces the dynamic and ever-changing environment of the stormy sea, the analogy prompts reflection on the nature of personal resilience and adaptability. Just as the vessel must adapt to the shifting circumstances, individuals are called upon to navigate life's uncertainties, make decisions, and chart a course through the complexities of their existence. The constant change depicted in the storm mirrors the fluidity and evolution inherent in life, 
prompting contemplation on the transformative nature of human experience. The analogy also invites exploration of the concept of personal identity amidst the turbulence of life. Much like the ship undergoing wear and tear in the storm, individuals may undergo transformations, learn from experiences, and evolve over time. The question emerges, what elements of identity remain steadfast and central amid life's turbulence? This aspect of the analogy encourages introspection on the core aspects that contribute to one's sense of self. Additionally, the ship in a storm analogy encourages contemplation of the destination or purpose guiding the individual's journey. Analogous to a ship having a harbor to reach or a quest to fulfill, individuals may harbor goals, aspirations, or a sense of purpose that directs their trajectory through life. The metaphor becomes a vessel for exploring the existential questions surrounding the pursuit of meaning and objectives that lend purpose to one's journey. The Infinite Monkey Theorem The Infinite Monkey Theorem is a thought experiment in probability and mathematics that humorously suggests that, given an infinite amount of time, a monkey randomly pressing keys on a typewriter could eventually produce any given text, including the complete works of William Shakespeare. The idea is often used to illustrate concepts related to randomness, probability, and the vastness of possibilities. The thought experiment goes like this. Imagine an infinite number of monkeys randomly pressing keys on typewriters for an infinite amount of time. According to probability theory, it is conceivable that, at some point, one of the monkeys will accidentally type out a specific text such as a Shakespearean play, letter by letter. The Memory Trace Theory The Memory Trace Theory, also known as the Engram Theory, represents a historical concept in psychology that delves into the intricate processes of memory storage and retrieval in the brain. At its core, this theory posits the existence of a physical or biochemical memory trace that corresponds to individual memories. This trace, often referred to as an engram, suggests that the formation of memories involves tangible changes in the neural structure of the brain. Central to the memory trace theory is the notion of the engram, a hypothetical representation of a memory within the brain. The idea is rooted in the concept that memories, whether of events, facts, or experiences, leave a lasting imprint on the neural circuits. While the term engram was popularized by the German neuroscientist Richard Seemann in the early 20th century, the theory has undergone refinement and adjustment over time as our understanding of neurobiology has advanced. In practical terms, the theory proposes that memories are stored in the brain, and the act of recalling a memory involves the reactivation or reconstruction of the neural pathways associated with that memory. The engram is considered the physical basis that facilitates the encoding, storage, and retrieval of memories. The intricate dance of neural activity, synaptic changes, and network reorganization contributes to the formation and maintenance of these engrams. Furthermore, the memory trace theory is closely intertwined with the concept of neuroplasticity, which underscores the brain's remarkable ability to adapt and reorganize itself over time. Changes in synaptic strength, the formation of new synapses, and alterations in neural networks are all considered integral mechanisms in the creation and modification of memory traces. The Wisdom of Crowds The Wisdom of Crowds is a concept that delves into the dynamics of collective decision-making, suggesting that the aggregated judgments of a diverse group can exhibit a remarkable level of accuracy and insight. Coined by James Surowiecki in his book of the same name, the idea challenges the traditional belief that individual experts or authorities always possess superior wisdom. Instead, it argues that under certain conditions, the collective intelligence of a diverse group can outperform individual experts in making sound decisions. Central to the concept is the emphasis on diversity within the group. The effectiveness of the crowd's judgment is believed to hinge on the diversity of its members. When individuals bring varied perspectives, information, and approaches to the table, 
the collective decision-making process benefits from a more comprehensive consideration of possibilities and solutions. Another critical principle is the independence of individual decisions. The judgment within the crowd should ideally be made independently, without undue influence from others. This independence ensures that a broad range of information and insights is taken into account, contributing to the overall wisdom of the group. The aggregation of opinions is a key mechanism in realizing the wisdom of crowds. By collecting and synthesizing the diverse perspectives within the group, a more accurate and informed decision or prediction can emerge. This aggregation process is what allows the collective intelligence of the crowd to shine. The Mirror Stage The Mirror Stage, a psychoanalytic concept introduced by Jacques Lacan, serves as a pivotal framework for understanding the development of self-recognition and identity in infants. This critical phase typically unfolds during the early stages of infancy, usually between 6 and 18 months, when a child first encounters its own reflection in a mirror. Lacan posited that this moment of self-perception is transformative, shaping the child's emerging sense of identity in multifaceted ways. During the mirror stage, the infant undergoes a process of visual identification with its reflected image. The mirror provides a visual representation of the body that appears more coherent and unified than the fragmented and uncoordinated sensory experiences the infant has of its own physical form. This visual coherence becomes a source of self-recognition and identity formation. The term imaginary in Lacan's framework emphasizes the role of images and perceptions during this stage. The reflected image in the mirror becomes a powerful source of identification for the child. The infant, in a sense, identifies with the idealized and unified image, constructing an initial sense of selfhood based on this visual representation. Crucially, the mirror stage contributes to the formation of the ego, a central concept in Lacanian psychoanalysis. The ego, according to Lacan, is not a stable or unified entity, but rather a construct influenced by external images, social dynamics, and internal conflicts. The mirror, as a symbolic representation of the external world, plays a fundamental role in shaping the infant's developing ego. While the mirror stage is foundational in Lacanian theory, it introduces a paradoxical element of alienation. The idealized image in the mirror establishes a standard of completeness and unity that the child perceives as external and unattainable. This sets the stage for a lifelong tension between the idealized self and the actual lived experience, contributing to ongoing processes of identity negotiation and development. The Prisoner's Dilemma The Prisoner's Dilemma, a foundational concept in game theory, presents a scenario where two rational individuals, often implicated in a crime, must make decisions that balance self-interest and collective well-being. In this classic dilemma, the choices are to cooperate by remaining silent or betray the other to the authorities. The outcomes are structured such that betraying guarantees a lighter sentence or freedom, while cooperation leads to a moderately lighter sentence if both choose this path. However, if one betrays the other while the other cooperates, the betrayer gains the most favorable outcome, and the cooperator faces the harshest consequences. The inherent tension arises from the fact that, from an individualistic standpoint, there is a strong incentive to betray, regardless of the other's choice. Paradoxically, when both individuals act in their self-interest, the overall result is suboptimal for both with a harsher outcome than if they had cooperated. This dilemma serves as a powerful model for understanding strategic interactions and decision-making in various real-world scenarios. Its applicability extends to economics, political science, and social psychology, shedding light on the challenges individuals face when conflicting incentives force them to navigate the delicate balance between personal gain and collective welfare. The Prisoner's Dilemma underscores the complexities inherent in cooperation and trust-building, 
providing insights into the dynamics of strategic decision-making in situations involving self-interested actors. Addressing the dilemma often involves finding mechanisms to establish trust, foster cooperation, and align individual incentives with collective goals. The Overview Effect The Overview Effect encapsulates a transformative and transcendent experience reported by astronauts who have the opportunity to view Earth from space. Coined by Frank White, a space philosopher, in 1987, this phenomenon describes a profound shift in perspective that occurs when astronauts witness the Earth from orbit or the Moon. At the heart of the overview effect is a deep and overwhelming sense of interconnectedness, as astronauts see the planet without geopolitical borders and divisions that characterize life on the surface. This perspective fosters a global consciousness that transcends national and cultural boundaries, emphasizing the shared responsibility for the well-being of the planet. Astronauts who undergo the overview effect commonly report a heightened environmental awareness. The view from space instills a profound appreciation for Earth's natural beauty and resources, as well as recognition of its fragility. This newfound awareness often leads to a commitment to environmental stewardship, as astronauts return to Earth with a sense of responsibility for preserving and protecting the delicate balance of our home planet. The overview effect is marked by a profound sense of awe and humility. The vastness of space and the fragile appearance of Earth against the cosmic backdrop evoke a deep humility, challenging the conventional ways in which individuals perceive their place in the universe. This shift in perspective encourages contemplation on the interconnectedness of all life and the shared responsibility for the well-being of the planet, fostering a sense of unity and common purpose among humanity. Ultimately, the overview effect represents a cognitive and emotional transformation that extends beyond the realm of space exploration. It prompts a re-evaluation of human priorities, emphasizing the importance of cooperation and collective action in addressing global challenges. While not universally experienced by all astronauts, the impact of the overview effect has sparked philosophical and psychological discussions about the significance of space exploration in shaping human perspectives and fostering a deeper appreciation for the interconnected nature of our existence on Earth. The Mandela Effect The Mandela Effect is a phenomenon in which a large group of people collectively and mistakenly remember an event, fact, or detail in a way that is inconsistent with the actual historical record. The term was coined by Fiona Broom, who noticed that she, along with others, shared a false prison memory of Nelson Mandela, even though Mandela was released from prison in 1990 and went on to become the president of South Africa. This collective false memory is not limited to the Mandela example and extends to various other instances where large groups of people misremember details, such as the spelling of a brand name, a famous quote, or the existence of a particular product or event. The Mandela effect is often attributed to a combination of factors, including the fallibility of human memory, cognitive biases, and the influence of misinformation or social reinforcement. One explanation for the Mandela effect is the reconstructive nature of memory. Memories are not exact replicas of past events, but are reconstructed and influenced by various factors, including one's beliefs, experiences, and exposure to information over time. As individuals discuss and share memories with others, the collective reinforcement of a particular version can contribute to the formation of a shared, albeit incorrect, memory. The Mandela Effect has gained attention in popular culture and has become a subject of interest in psychology and sociology. It serves as a reminder of the malleability of human memory and the potential for shared false memories to emerge within large groups. The Biophilia Hypothesis The Biophilia Hypothesis, introduced by biologist E. O. Wilson, posits that humans possess an intrinsic and innate connection to nature and living organisms, shaped by the evolutionary history of our species. This hypothesis suggests that throughout human evolution, individuals who were more attuned to the natural world had a survival advantage, 
as the ability to recognize edible plants, avoid predators, and find suitable habitats for shelter and resources played a crucial role in survival. Central to the hypothesis is the idea that this connection is deeply ingrained in the human psyche, influencing emotions, cognitive processes, and overall well-being. It further asserts that humans exhibit an aesthetic preference for natural settings, with exposure to nature having positive effects on health, stress reduction, mood enhancement, and cognitive function. This innate biophilic tendency extends to cultural and artistic expressions, influencing various aspects of human creativity and shaping architectural and design practices. While the biophila hypothesis is not without its critics, it has significantly contributed to the understanding of the profound impact that nature has on human flourishing, influencing fields such as environmental psychology, design, and urban planning to incorporate natural elements into built environments for the betterment of human health and quality of life. The Laplace's Demon Laplace's Demon is a thought experiment in the philosophy of science and determinism, named after the French mathematician and physicist Pierre Simon Laplace. The concept revolves around the idea of a hypothetical, intellectually powerful entity that, if provided with complete and precise information about the current state of the universe, could predict with absolute certainty the future state of every particle and event in the universe, as well as retrodict its past. The underlying assumption in Laplace's demon is strict determinism, which posits that the future is entirely determined by the present state of the universe and the laws governing its behavior. In other words, if you had perfect knowledge of the positions, velocities, and properties of every particle in the universe at a particular moment, along with a complete understanding of the governing physical laws, the future and past states of the universe could be precisely calculated. Laplace's demon, as a conceptual entity, reflects Laplace's optimism about the potential for scientific knowledge and mathematical precision. The thought experiment is famously associated with Laplace's statement, often paraphrased as, an intellect which at a certain moment would know all the forces that set nature in motion, and all the positions of all the items in which nature is composed, if this intellect were also vast enough to submit these data to analysis, it would embrace in a single formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of its tiniest atom. For such an intellect nothing would be uncertain, and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. The Paradox of Choice The paradox of choice introduced by physicist Barry Schwartz underscores the counterintuitive idea that an abundance of options can lead to dissatisfaction and decision paralysis. In a modern world where choices abound, Individuals often face the challenge of navigating through a multitude of alternatives, and paradoxically, this wealth of options can result in negative consequences for decision-making and overall well-being. Decision paralysis is a central concept of this paradox, where the sheer number of choices overwhelms individuals, making it difficult for them to arrive at a decision. This can be compounded by escalating expectations, as the belief in an elusive, perfect choice among many options raises the bar, making it harder for any single option to meet or exceed those lofty expectations. Moreover, the paradox of choice introduces the concept of decision regret, where individuals, in the aftermath of making a choice, may question whether they made the optimal decision and engage in self-blame. Rather than leading to increased happiness, the plethora of choices can contribute to diminished well-being and life satisfaction. To navigate this paradox, individuals may employ strategies such as simplifying decision-making processes, setting clear priorities, and focusing on essential criteria for evaluating options. Embracing the idea that good enough can be satisfactory and recognizing the limitations of perfectionism may also mitigate the negative effects of decision overload. The implications of the paradox of choice extends across various domains, prompting discussions about the role of simplification and curation in creating more meaningful and satisfying experiences in a world characterized by an ever-expanding array of options. The Many Worlds Interpretation 
The Many Worlds Interpretation, MWI, is a conceptual framework in quantum mechanics that proposes a fascinating and provocative idea. Every possible outcome of a quantum measurement or event creates a separate and distinct universe. Coined by physicist Hugh Everett III in his doctoral thesis in 1957, the Many Worlds Interpretation challenges conventional interpretations of quantum mechanics, which typically involve the collapse of the wave function and the selection of a single outcome. According to the Many Worlds Interpretation, when a quantum system exists in a superposition of multiple states, each of these states branches off into a separate universe resulting in a vast ensemble of parallel realities. This implies that, at any given moment, the universe as a whole is continually splitting into exponentially increasing numbers of parallel universes, each representing a different quantum possibility. The Ontological Argument The ontological argument, notably formulated by Anselm of Canterbury, is a philosophical endeavor to establish the existence of God based on the concept of God as the most perfect being. At its core, the argument hinges on the idea that the very definition of God implies existence, as it is more perfect for a being to exist in reality than merely in the mind. Anselm posits that the concept of God as the most perfect conceivable being necessitates existence for God to truly embody perfection. The argument unfolds by asserting that the mere conception of God in the mind is not sufficient, as a greater being could be conceived, one that exists both in the mind and in reality. Anselm contends that the non-existence of God contradicts the very nature of the concept of God as the most perfect being. Critics have raised various objections, including the contention that existence is not a predicate that can enhance the perfection of a being. Despite critiques and a lack of universal acceptance, the ontological argument has persisted as a significant and enduring topic of debate within the realms of philosophy of religion and metaphysics. Philosophers, ranging from Descartes to Kant, have engaged in critiques or offered alternative perspectives, contributing to the ongoing exploration of the relationship between the concept of God and the question of existence. The Veblenian Dichotomy the Veblenian dichotomy, named after the American economist Thorstein Veblen, is a concept that explores the divergence between socially necessary goods and individually necessary goods within a society. Veblen, known for his contributions to institutional economics, introduced the idea in his work The Theory of the Leisure Class, published in 1899. Socially necessary goods are those that are valued and sought after primarily for their social standing and prestige. These goods often serve as symbols of status and contribute to one's position within a social hierarchy. Examples may include luxury items, high-end fashion, or other conspicuous consumption that signals wealth and social distinction. On the other hand, Individually necessary goods are those essential for meeting basic individual needs and survival. These goods are not driven by social status, but rather by their utility and necessity for an individual's well-being. Basic food, shelter, clothing, and other fundamental necessities fall into this category. The Veblenian dichotomy highlights the tension between these two types of goods and the contrasting motivations behind their consumption. In societies influenced by conspicuous consumption, individuals may allocate resources towards socially necessary goods to enhance their social standing and prestige. This can result in a divergence where the pursuit of status symbols takes precedence over the fulfillment of basic individual needs. The Singularity the singularity is a speculative concept that envisions a future point at which technological progress, particularly in the fields of artificial intelligence AI, and computing, accelerates to the extent that it surpasses human intelligence. Coined by mathematician and computer scientist Werner Wing in the early 1990s, the singularity is often associated with the idea that once this threshold is reached, it becomes challenging for humans to predict or comprehend the developments that follow. The concept of the singularity revolves around the notion that as technology advances, it will lead to the creation of superintelligent entities 
potentially surpassing human cognitive capabilities. These entities could then rapidly enhance their own intelligence, creating a cascade of self-improvement that accelerates beyond human understanding. The singularity is often linked to the idea of an intelligence explosion where AI systems recursively improve themselves, leading to an unprecedented leap in intelligence. Proponents of the singularity argue that it holds the potential for solving complex problems, advancing scientific research, and addressing global challenges. However, concerns and debates surround the societal, ethical, and existential implications of the singularity. Skeptics question the feasibility of such a scenario and raise ethical concerns about the control and impact of superintelligent entities on human existence. The singularity has become a popular topic in discussions about the future of technology and artificial intelligence, with various experts and visionaries offering divergent views on its likelihood and potential consequences. The Flynn Effect the Flynn effect refers to the observed and consistent rise in intelligence test scores across generations. Coined by political scientist James Flynn, who extensively researched and documented this phenomenon, the Flynn effect challenges traditional notions that intelligence is a fixed and unchanging trait. Instead, it suggests that average intelligence scores have been steadily increasing over time. The Flynn effect became widely recognized in the early 20th century when researchers noticed that individuals who took earlier versions of intelligence tests, such as the Welcher's intelligence scales, tended to score lower than those taking the same tests in subsequent generations. The effect is not limited to a specific country or culture, but has been observed in various parts of the world. Several factors have been proposed to explain the Flynn effect. One major contributor is believed to be improvements in living conditions, education, and access to information. As societies have progressed, individuals have been exposed to more stimulating environments, better nutrition, and increased access to education, all of which are factors that can positively influence cognitive development. The Flynn effect has important implications for understanding human intelligence and raises questions about the nature and causes of the observed increase in scores. While the effect highlights positive trends in cognitive abilities, it also underscores the need for regular updates and revisions of intelligence tests to ensure their continued relevance and accuracy. The Flynn effect challenges the notion of a fixed and unalterable intelligence quotient IQ, and encourages ongoing exploration into the multifaceted factors shaping cognitive abilities. The Just World Hypothesis The Just World Hypothesis is a cognitive bias and social psychological concept that reflects the belief that people generally get what they deserve and that the world is fundamentally just and fair. Coined by psychologist Melvin Lerner in the 1960s, this hypothesis suggests that individuals have a psychological need to perceive the world as an orderly and predictable place where actions lead to just outcomes. According to the Just World Hypothesis, people tend to attribute events, both positive and negative, to a sense of justice or fairness. This attribution is often driven by a desire to maintain a sense of control and predictability in one's own life. For instance, Individuals may be inclined to believe that those who experience success, happiness, or positive outcomes have earned or deserved them through their actions, skills, or virtues. Conversely, individuals facing adversity or negative outcomes may be perceived as deserving of their fate due to assumed character flaws or poor choices. The Just World Hypothesis has implications for how people perceive and respond to social issues, particularly those involving inequality, poverty, or victim-blaming. It can lend to the tendency to rationalize or justify societal structures and inequities by assuming that those who are successful deserve their success, while those facing challenges must somehow be responsible for their own predicaments. While the Just World Hypothesis serves as a cognitive mechanism to cope with uncertainty and maintain a sense of order, it can contribute to a lack of empathy and understanding for those facing adversity. Social psychologists and researchers have explored the impact of this bias on judgments, decision-making, and attitudes towards social issues, 
aiming to raise awareness about the complexity of factors influencing life outcomes and the need for more nuanced perspectives on justice and fairness in society. The Butterfly Dream Schwanza's work, also titled Schwanza, or Sheng Tzu, includes a famous passage known as The Butterfly Dream, which raises profound questions about the nature of reality, perception, and the self. In this passage, Schwanza recounts a dream in which he is a butterfly, fluttering about without any awareness of being Schwanza. Upon waking, he reflects on the uncertainty of reality, posing the fundamental question, was he Schwanza dreaming of being a butterfly, or is he now a butterfly dreaming of being Schwanza? This contemplation challenges the distinction between dreams and reality and calls into question the nature of identity and existence. The butterfly dream serves as a metaphor for the illusory and fleeting nature of reality. Schwanza suggests that our understanding of the self and the external world is subjective and contingent, much like the experiences in a dream. The passage invites contemplation on the fluidity of perception and the difficulty of distinguishing between what is real and what is a product of our consciousness. Schwanza's philosophical approach, including the butterfly dream, aligns with Taoist perspectives that emphasize the reality of opposites, the impermanence of forms, and the interconnectedness of all things. The concept encourages individuals to question their assumptions about reality, prompting a deeper exploration of the nature of existence and the limits of human understanding. The Sapir-Whorf Hypothesis The Sapir-Whorf Hypothesis, put forth by linguists Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Whorf, is a theory that explores the intricate relationship between language, thought, and perception. At its core, the hypothesis suggests that the structure and vocabulary of a language exerts a significant influence on the way its speakers perceive and interpret the world around them. The stronger form of the hypothesis, known as linguist determinism, proposes that language not only influences but entirely determines thought, shaping the cognitive landscape of its speakers. In contrast, the milder form, linguistic relativity, acknowledges that while language may not entirely dictate thought, it does play a crucial role in shaping and influencing it. This conceptual framework gained prominence through Worf's analysis of indigenous languages, revealing how linguistic features could impact speakers' conceptualization of time, among other things. While the sapir whorf hypothesis has sparked extensive research and discussions about the interplay between language and cognition, it remains a subject of debate. Critics argue that the relationship between language and thought is multifaceted, with cultural, social, and individual factors contributing alongside linguistic elements. Despite ongoing debates and challenges, the hypothesis has had a lasting impact on linguistic and cognitive studies, prompting scholars to explore the intricate ways in which language shapes human perception and thought processes. The Peter Principle the Peter Principle is a humorous and satirical concept in organizational theory that was introduced by Canadian educator and sociologist Lawrence J. Peter in his 1969 book, The Peter Principle. This principle suggests that in hierarchical organizations, individuals tend to be promoted to positions where they eventually reach a level of incompetence. In other words, Employees rise through the ranks based on their confidence in their current roles until they reach a position where they are no longer effective. According to the Peter Principle, individuals are promoted because of their competence in their current roles, demonstrating the skills and abilities necessary for success. However, as they continue to be promoted, they may eventually reach a level where the skills required for the new position exceed their capabilities. At this point, they become incompetent in their roles, and further promotion is less likely. The principle is often humorously expressed as, in a hierarchy, every employee tends to rise to their level of incompetence. The Peter Principle reflects the inherent challenges and limitations in traditional hierarchical organizational structures, where promotion is often based on performance in their current role rather than the skills required for the next level. The Red Queen Hypothesis 
The Red Queen hypothesis is an evolutionary theory that proposes that organisms must continually adapt, evolve, and compete with each other in order to survive and reproduce. The name Red Queen is inspired by a character in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, who, while running, remarks that one must run as fast as possible just to stay in the same place. The hypothesis was formally introduced in the context of biology by evolutionary biologist Lee Van Valen in 1973. It suggests that, in a changing environment, species must undergo continuous adaptation and improvement to keep up with the evolution of other species they interact with, such as predators, prey, parasites, or competitors. In other words, the evolutionary arms race is a constant struggle, much like the characters in Carol's Tale, who must keep running just to maintain their current position. The Red Queen hypothesis is often associated with coevolution, where species influence each other's evolution. For example, predators evolve better hunting strategies, and prey evolve better defenses in response. This reciprocal process of adaptation is considered crucial for long-term survival and reproductive success of species in dynamic environments. The Fermi Paradox Solutions The Fermi Paradox Solutions encompass a diverse array of theories seeking to reconcile the high probability of extraterrestrial civilizations with the apparent absence of observable evidence of their existence. The rare earth hypothesis suggests that the conditions conducive to complex life, like those found on earth, might be exceptionally rare in the universe, limiting the emergence of intelligent civilizations. The great filter theory posits significant hurdles or filters in the development of life and civilizations, which may explain why few make it to the point of advanced space exploration. Another perspective explores the possibility of self-destruction, proposing that many civilizations may succumb to war, environmental collapse, or other catastrophic events. Alternatively, the idea of technological stagnation suggests that intelligent civilizations may reach a certain technological level, but then cease advancing or lose interest in space exploration. The simulation hypothesis introduces the idea that our reality may be a simulated construct, which could influence the patterns of extraterrestrial contact. Challenges associated with interstellar travel, cryptic aliens intentionally avoiding detection, and temporal misalignment, where civilizations exist at different times, also contribute to the diverse set of solutions. Each hypothesis offers a speculative lens through which scientists and thinkers attempt to make sense of the perplexing silence in our search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The Broken Windows Theory The Broken Windows Theory is a social theory that suggests visible signs of disorder and neglect in a community can contribute to an environment that encourages further crime and antisocial behavior. The theory was first introduced by social scientists James Q. Wilson and George L. Kelly in a 1982 article titled Broken Windows, The Police and Neighborhood Safety. The concept draws its name from the metaphor of a broken window in the building, left unrepaired, leading to a perception of neglect and an increased likelihood of further damage. The central idea of the broken windows theory is that signs of disorder and neglect, such as broken windows, graffiti, or litter, send a signal that no one is in control or actively caring for the community. In such an environment, Individuals may be more likely to engage in criminal activities, as the lack of order and maintenance suggests a weak social fabric and a diminished sense of social norms. The theory became influential in the field of criminology and law enforcement, particularly in discussions about community policing and strategies for crime prevention. Advocates of the broken windows theory argue that addressing minor signs of disorder and maintaining a visible presence in the community can contribute to a reduction in overall crime rates. Critics, however, question the causal relationship between visible disorder and serious crime, emphasizing the importance of addressing underlying social and economic factors contributing to criminal behavior. There are also concerns about the potential for biased or overly aggressive policing when implementing broken windows strategies. The White Bear Phenomenon 
The white bear phenomenon, also known as the ironic process theory, refers to the paradoxical effect of attempting not to think about something, which often leads to an increased preoccupation with that very thought. This phenomenon was notably explored by psychologist Daniel Wegner in the early 1990s. The term white bear comes from Wegner's instruction to study participants to avoid thinking about a white bear. In experiments, individuals were asked to suppress thoughts of a white bear. However, the results consistently showed that the more they tried to suppress the thoughts of the bear, the more frequently the thought intruded their consciousness. This phenomenon is attributed to the cognitive processes involved in thought suppression. Wegner proposed that when individuals consciously try to suppress certain thoughts, they engage in a monitoring process to detect and control unwanted cognitions. Paradoxically, this monitoring process can make the forbidden thoughts more accessible and increase their frequency of occurrence. The mental effort to suppress a thought may, in fact, heighten its salience. The white bear phenomenon has broader implications beyond the laboratory setting, extending to everyday experiences of mental control and attempts to avoid unwanted thoughts. It highlights the challenges individuals face when trying to control their thoughts and suggests that strategies involving acceptance and mindfulness may be more effective than direct suppression. The Collective Unconscious The Collective Unconscious is a concept developed by Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung, representing a foundational element of his analytical psychology. According to Jung, the Collective Unconscious is a layer of the unconscious mind that contains shared, universal experiences, memories, symbols, and archetypes common to all human beings, transcending individual and cultural differences. Unlike the personal unconscious, which holds an individual's unique experiences, the collective unconscious is a reservoir of archaic and cross-cultural elements. Archetypes, in Jungian psychology, are recurring symbols, images, or patterns that emerge from the collective unconscious and are expressed in various myths, religions, dreams, and cultural narratives. Examples of archetypes include the hero, the mother, the shadow, and the anima slash animus. Jung believed that these archetypes are inherent in the human psyche and shape our perceptions, behaviors, and cultural expressions. The collective unconscious is seen as a source of creativity, inspiration, and a shared cultural heritage that connects individuals across time and space. Dreams, myths, and symbols are considered pathways to accessing the contents of the collective unconscious, providing insights into the deeper layers of the human psyche. Jung's concept of the collective unconscious has influenced fields beyond psychology, including literature, art, mythology, and comparative religion. It offers a perspective on the commonality of human experience and the symbolic language that underlies various cultural expressions. The Boltzmann Brain Hypothesis The Boltzmann Brain Hypothesis is a speculative and controversial idea in theoretical physics and cosmology named after Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann. The hypothesis suggests that, given the vastness and potential randomness of the universe, it is conceivable that a fully formed and self-aware brain, complete with false memories, could spontaneously arise through random fluctuations in a large, empty space, even in the absence of a fully developed universe or the conventional processes of biological evolution. The concept is deeply rooted in statistical mechanics and the second law of thermodynamics, which describes the tendency of systems to evolve towards states of greater disorder or entropy. According to the Boltzmann brain hypothesis, it might be statistically more probable for a simple, organized structure like a brain to appear spontaneously than for a complex, highly ordered universe to form through natural processes. However, the hypothesis faces significant challenges and criticisms. One major objection is the sheer improbability of a brain forming by random chance, especially one with coherent thoughts and memories. The timescales and conditions required for such an event to occur are considered astronomically unlikely within the current understanding of physics. 
The Boltzmann braid hypothesis also raises broader questions about the nature of reality, the reliability of our perceptions, and the validity of the scientific method if the universe is considered a product of random chance rather than governed by consistent natural laws. The Ship of Fools The Ship of Fools is a metaphorical concept that has been used in literature, art, and philosophy to symbolize a vessel or community populated by individuals considered deranged, mentally ill, or morally corrupt. The metaphor has historical roots and has been explored in various cultural and intellectual contexts. One notable reference to the Ship of Fools appears in Sebastian Brandt's 1494 satirical poem Das Narrenschiff, The Ship of Fools. In this work, Brandt depicts a ship carrying a group of people who embody various forms of folly, ignorance, and moral corruption. Each passenger on the ship represents a particular vice or absurdity making the vessel a microcosm of a society plagued by human shortcomings. The Ship of Fools metaphor became a recurring theme in art and literature during the Renaissance and beyond. Artists and writers used it as a vehicle for social criticism, exploring themes related to human folly, moral decay, and the dangers of unchecked irrationality. The concept resonated in a world grappling with societal changes, religious reforms, and shifting cultural norms. The Ship of Fools metaphor also found expression in the works of philosophers and thinkers like Desiderius Erasmus, who expanded on the idea of human folly and the need for self-awareness and moral improvement. The metaphor continues to be referenced in contemporary discussions about the state of society, mental health, and the consequences of collective irrationality. The Two Envelope Paradox the two-envelope paradox is a thought experiment that involves a decision-making scenario with two envelopes, each containing money. This paradox explores the idea of whether it is rational to switch envelopes under certain conditions, as it is often used to illustrate the complexities and subtleties in probability and decision theory. The scenario typically unfolds as follows. You are presented with two indistinguishable envelopes, and each contains a sum of money. Let's call the amount in the first envelope x. The second envelope contains either 2x or 0.5x, each with equal probability. Now, you are allowed to choose one of the envelopes, and you pick the first one. At this point, you know that it contains x, but you are uncertain about the amount in the other envelope. The paradox arises when you are given the option to switch envelopes. The dilemma stems from the fact that the expected value of the other envelope is 1.25x, 0.5 times 2x plus 0.5 times 0.5x, which is higher than the known value of x in the envelope you initially selected. Intuitively, it seems advantageous to always switch, as the other envelope is expected to contain more money. However, the paradox lies in the fact that a similar argument can be made for the other envelope, creating a loop of reasoning that appears to have no definitive solution. The Uncertainty of Measurement The uncertainty of measurement challenges the notion of absolute precision in scientific measurements by acknowledging that all measurements inherently involve some degree of uncertainty. This concept is a fundamental aspect of metrology, the science of measurement and it recognizes that no measurement process can yield an exact or completely accurate value. Uncertainty in measurement arises from various sources, including the limitations of instruments, variations in experimental conditions, and the inherent probabilistic nature of certain physical phenomena. Even with state-of-the-art equipment and careful experimental design, it is impossible to eliminate all sources of uncertainty. To address uncertainty, scientists use a measure called uncertainty interval, or margin of error, to express the range within which the true value of a measured quantity is likely to fall. This interval is often expressed as a confidence level, representing the probability that the true value lies within the specified range. The concept of the uncertainty of measurement has important implications for the interpretation and communication of scientific results. 
it emphasizes the need for transparency regarding the precision and reliability of measurements and encourages scientists to report not only the measured value but also the associated uncertainty. One widely used approach for expressing uncertainty is through the use of a standard deviation or standard error. These statistical measures provide a quantitative representation of the spread of values in a set of measurements, allowing scientists to estimate the range of values that likely includes the true value. The McCarthy Paradox The McCarthy Paradox is a concept related to self-reference and the application of universal statements to themselves within a system. Named after the computer scientist and artificial intelligence pioneer John McCarthy, this paradox explores the idea that any universal statement made about a system can potentially be applied to itself, leading to logical complexities and self-reference. One version of the McCarthy paradox can be expressed in a statement such as, This statement is true. If we consider this statement to be true, then it accurately describes itself. However, if we consider it false, then it accurately describes itself as false. This creates a logical loop or paradox, as the statement seems to defy straightforward classification as either true or false. The McCarthy paradox is closely related to other famous paradoxes, including the liar paradox, e.g., this statement is false, and Gödel's incompleteness theorems. These paradoxes highlight the challenges and limitations inherent in creating logical systems that attempt to describe their own properties or truths. The paradox echoes themes in formal systems, mathematics, and philosophy of language, prompting reflection on the complexities that arise when a system attempts to make statements about itself. It draws attention to the potential for self-reference to lead to logical contradictions and challenges conventional notions of consistency and completeness within formal systems. The Ship of State Analogy The Ship of State Analogy, with its roots in ancient Greek philosophy, provides a metaphorical lens through which governance and political authority are examined. Plato, in The Republic, introduced the idea of the state as a ship navigating the political sea, with citizens akin to sailors and leaders serving as navigators. This metaphor emphasizes the crucial role of wise and skilled leaders in steering the course of the state through the challenges of the political landscape. Leadership qualities such as wisdom, foresight, and competence are central to the analogy, highlighting their significance in effective governance. The sailors on the ship represent the citizens of the state drawing attention to the concept of civic duty and the social contract between the governed and the governing. In the ship of state, citizens are expected to follow the directives of the leaders for the collective well-being, fostering a sense of obedience and cooperation. The metaphor underscores the interdependence between leaders and citizens, emphasizing that effective governance requires mutual trust, cooperation, and a shared commitment to the common good. The challenges faced by the ship as it navigates the sea symbolize the complexities and uncertainties inherent in political life. Leaders are tasked with navigating these challenges to ensure the stability and prosperity of the state. The turbulent sea serves as a metaphor for the dynamic and often unpredictable nature of the political landscape, requiring leaders to exhibit adaptability and resilience. The Expanding Moral Circle the expanding moral circle is a concept in ethics that describes the phenomenon where moral consideration and empathy extend beyond one's immediate social or cultural group to include a broader range of individuals or entities. This idea suggests that over time, societies and individuals have the capacity to broaden their moral concerns, recognizing the moral worth and rights of an increasingly diverse set of beings. The notion of an expanding moral circle is often associated with the moral development of individuals and the evolution of societal ethical norms. One classic example is the progression from tribal or familial moral considerations to the recognition of the rights and worth of individuals outside one's immediate group. This expansion can continue to encompass people of different races, genders, ethnicities, and social classes. Moreover, the concept is not limited to human relationships. 
It also extends to the moral consideration of non-human entities, including animals and the environment. Advocates for animal rights and environmental ethics argue that recognizing the moral standing of non-human beings is part of the ongoing expansion of the moral circle. Philosophers and ethicists, such as Peter Singer and Aldo Leopold, have explored the idea of the expanding moral circle in their works. Singer, for instance, discusses the concept of speciesism and argues for extending moral consideration to animals based on their capacity to suffer. Leopold's land ethic proposes a broader moral framework that includes not only human interests, but also the well-being of the entire ecological community. The Doctrine of Double Effect The Doctrine of Double Effect is a moral principle that delves into the ethical evaluation of actions with both positive and negative consequences. Rooted in deontological or rule-based ethical theories, this doctrine offers criteria for determining the moral permissibility of actions when the agent anticipates both good and bad effects. The doctrine was notably shaped by figures like Thomas Aquinas and further developed by philosophers such as Philippa Foote and Joseph M. Boyle. Central to the doctrine are three key elements. First, the agent must have a good intention in carrying out the action, directing it towards the positive outcome while recognizing the negative outcome as an unintended consequence. Second, there must be a sense of proportionality, with the overall good resulting from the action outweighing the bad. Lastly, the agent should exhaust all reasonable alternatives to avoid the bad effect before resorting to the action with dual consequences. One illustrative scenario frequently used to explain the doctrine of double effect involves self-defense. If an individual faces a threat of lethal force and responds with lethal force, the intention is self-defense, good, even though it results in harm or death to the attacker, bad. This doctrine serves to distinguish between permissible and impermissible actions, relying on considerations of intention, proportionality, and necessity. The Attention Economy The attention economy is a concept that characterizes the contemporary economic landscape in which attention has become a scarce and valuable resource. In this framework, attention is treated as a commodity, and business and individuals compete for the limited attention of consumers. This concept has gained prominence with the rise of digital technologies, social media, and information overload, which have profoundly influenced how information is disseminated and consumed. In the attention economy, the traditional economic factors of supply and demand are applied to human attention. With a surplus of information and content available, individuals face a limited capacity to process and engage with the vast array of stimuli presented to them. As a result, attention becomes a valuable and scarce resource that individuals allocate selectively. Businesses, media outlets, advertisers, and content creators recognize the competitive nature of the attention economy. Strategies for capturing and retaining audience attention become crucial for success. This has led to the development of attention-grabbing techniques, personalized content recommendations, and platforms designed to maximize user engagement. The rise of social media platforms exemplifies the dynamics of the attention economy. Social media companies compete to capture users' attention by offering personalized content feeds, notifications, and features designed to keep users engaged. Users, in turn, become both consumers and contributors to the attention marketplace as they share, like, and interact with content. Critics of the attention economy raise concerns about the potential negative effects, including information overload, reduced focus, and the exploitation of attention through manipulative techniques. Additionally, there are ethical considerations surrounding the monetization of attention, as seen in advertising models that profit from user engagement. The Zero-Sum Game The Zero-Sum Game is a concept that describes a situation in which the total amount of resources or utility remains constant and any gain by one participant is exactly offset by an equivalent loss incurred by another participant. In other words, 
the total value or wealth in the system remains unchanged, and any benefit obtained by one party comes at the expense of others. This concept is frequently used in game theory, economics, and competitive scenarios to analyze situations where participants' interests are in direct opposition. In a zero-sum game, the total pie of resources, wealth, or utility is fixed, and any increase in one participant's share corresponds to a proportionate decrease in the shares of other participants. Examples of zero-sum games can be found in various contexts, including economic transactions, sports competitions, and political negotiations. In financial markets, for instance, buying and selling securities can be considered a zero-sum game because the profit gained by one trader comes at the expense of another. Similarly, some competitive sports follow zero-sum dynamics, where one team's victory is mirrored by the other team's defeat. The concept of a zero-sum game is contrasted with non-zero-sum games, where cooperation and mutually beneficial outcomes are possible, and the total value or utility in the system can increase. In zero-sum games, participants are in direct competition for a fixed set of resources or outcomes, leading to a stark conflict of interests. The Vat-Grown Human Dilemma The Vat-Grown Human Dilemma raises profound ethical considerations surrounding the creation of beings through artificial means, particularly in laboratories or artificial wombs. This concept delves into the moral, philosophical, and societal implications of developing humans outside of natural reproductive processes. The term vat-grown often refers to individuals whose gestation and development occur entirely in controlled environments, potentially devoid of traditional familial and societal contexts. One central ethical concern is the status and rights of vat-grown individuals. Questions arise about their autonomy, personhood, and whether they should be accorded the same moral consideration and legal rights as naturally conceived individuals. Issues related to identity, social integration, and the potential for discrimination may also emerge, prompting a re-evaluation of established ethical frameworks. The creation of vat-grown humans could challenge existing notions of parenthood, kinship, and family structures. Ethical discussions often grapple with the implications of removing reproduction from the realm of interpersonal relationships and the potential consequences for human connection and societal norms. The vat-grown human dilemma also intersects with broader debates on bioethics and the responsible use of technology. Concerns about unintended consequences, misuse of scientific advancements, and the potential for exploitation or abuse of individuals created in laboratories underscores the need for ethical guidelines and regulations in emerging fields such as artificial reproduction. The Mere Exposure Effect The Mere Exposure Effect is a psychological phenomenon that describes the tendency of individuals to develop a preference for things or people merely because they are familiar with them. In other words, the more exposure a person has to a stimulus, be it an object, person, or idea, the more likely they are to develop a positive attitude or preference toward it. This effect was first coined by psychologist Robert Zions in the 1960s, and it has been studied in various contexts, including consumer behavior, social psychology, and advertising. The mere exposure effect suggests that mere repeated exposure can lead to increased liking and comfort even in the absence of any inherently positive qualities in the stimulus. Several factors contribute to the mere exposure effect. One key aspect is the idea that familiarity breeds a sense of safety and predictability. When individuals encounter something familiar, it requires less cognitive effort to process and understand leading to a sense of comfort and liking. Additionally, repeated exposure can create a sense of fluency or ease in processing the stimulus, which is then associated with positive feelings. The mere exposure effect has implications in various areas of life. In marketing and advertising, for example, companies often use repetition and exposure to make consumers more favorable toward their products. In social interactions, individuals may find themselves drawn to people they encounter frequently, 
even if they initially had no particular feelings about them. The Lottery Paradox The Lottery Paradox presents a thought experiment that delves into the philosophical nuances of probability, fairness, and our intuitive understanding of chance in lotteries. Conceived by philosopher Hayek, this paradox challenges our perceptions when dealing with situations where probabilities and outcomes interact in unexpected ways. In the context of a fair lottery with a multitude of tickets, each with a distinct number and an equal chance of winning, the paradox arises when a specific ticket is retrospectively identified as the winner. At the outset, the lottery is characterized by its fairness, with each ticket holding an identical probability of being the winning ticket. This aligns with our intuitive understanding of probability, where each participant has a very low chance of winning, but collectively, it seems highly likely that one ticket will emerge as the winner. However, the paradox emerges when the winning ticket is revealed, leading to a retrospective probability of one for that particular outcome, while the probabilities for all other losing tickets become zero. The lottery paradox prompts a philosophical exploration of how our intuition regarding chance and fairness in lotteries may be at odds with the principles of probability theory. It underscores a tension between our intuitive expectations and the mathematical definitions of probability. This tension becomes particularly evident when specific outcomes are identified, challenging our understanding of the equitable distribution of chances among the various tickets. Philosophers and probability theorists engage with the lottery paradox as it offers a fertile ground for discussions on the foundations of probability theory, fairness in random processes, and the psychology of how individuals perceive and reason about chance events. The paradox invites reflections on whether the fairness of a lottery is compromised when a winning ticket retrospectively appears to have had a probability of one. The Euthyphro Dilemma The Euthyphro Dilemma is a classic philosophical problem named after a dialogue in Plato's work, Euthyphro, where Socrates engages in a conversation with Euthyphro about the nature of morality and the relationship between the gods and morality. The dilemma poses a fundamental question about the nature of ethical values and their connection to divine authority. The central question of the Euthyphro dilemma is formulated as follows. Is something morally good because it is loved by the gods? Or do the gods love it because it is morally good? This dichotomy explores two possible sources for moral values. Either they derive from divine commands, or they exist independently of divine will. If something is considered morally good simply because the gods love it, then morality becomes arbitrary and contingent on the whims of the gods. In this scenario, what is morally right or wrong could change based on the gods' preferences, making morality subjective and potentially unpredictable. On the other hand, if the gods love something because it is inherently morally good, then morality is independent of divine commands. This implies that there exists a standard of morality that exists outside or prior to the God's will. In this case, morality is not contingent on divine authority, but is instead grounded in a higher, independent source. The Euthyphro Dilemma has significant implications for ethical theories and discussions about the foundation of morality. It challenges the notion that divine commands alone can serve as the ultimate basis for moral values and invites consideration of alternative sources for moral standards. The Tragedy of the Anti-Commons The Tragedy of the Anti-Commons is a concept that mirrors the more well-known tragedy of the commons, but applies to a situation where too many owners, rather than too few, hinder the efficient use of a resource. Coined by economist Michael Heller and Rebecca Eisenberg, the concept describes a scenario in which the fragmentation of ownership rights leads to underutilization or inefficient use of a resource. In a traditional commons scenario, the tragedy of the commons occurs when a shared resource is overused or depleted because each individual user has the incentive to exploit it for personal gain without considering the collective impact. The anti-commons, however, emerges when there are numerous individual owners, 
each with legal rights over specific aspects of a resource. This abundance of ownership can result in excessive transaction costs, coordination challenges, and difficulty reaching agreements on how to use the resource effectively. For example, in the context of intellectual property, the tragedy of the anti-commons might occur when numerous patent holders each own a small piece of a technology necessary for innovation. The proliferation of individual ownership rights can impede the development and commercialization of the technology because obtaining permission and negotiating agreements among multiple owners becomes cumbersome and costly. The Brain in a Vat The Brain in a Vat is a thought experiment that delves into epistemology, the branch of philosophy concerned with knowledge and belief. This particular scenario questions the reliability of one's perceptions and challenges the notion of what can be considered as true knowledge about the external world. The thought experiment is often associated with philosophers like Hilary Putnam and Donald Davidson. In the Brain in a Vat scenario, one is asked to imagine the possibility that their entire conscious experience, including all sensory perceptions and thoughts, is the result of being a brain that is artificially sustained and stimulated in a vat by a sophisticated computer. The brain receives electrical impulses that mimic the experiences one would have in the real world. Importantly, the individual in this scenario has no direct access to the external reality. All experiences are simulated. The philosophical puzzle arises when considering whether, in such a scenario, the individual could ever have knowledge about the external world. If all perceptions and experiences are generated by the computer, how could one distinguish between the simulated reality and the actual reality? This leads to the broader question of how we can be certain about the truthfulness of our beliefs and perceptions, even in our everyday, non-philosophical lives. The Brain in a Vat thought experiment contributes to discussions on skepticism and the nature of knowledge. It challenges foundational beliefs about the reliability of our sensory experiences and raises questions about the criteria for determining what counts as genuine knowledge. The Nature versus Nurture Debate The Nature versus Nurture Debate is a long-standing and complex discourse within the field of psychology and human development that explores the relative significance of genetic factors, nature, and environmental influences, nurture in shaping an individual's characteristics, behavior, and overall development. This debate has been a central focus in various scientific disciplines, including psychology, biology, sociology, and genetics. On the nature side of the debate, proponents argue that genetic factors play a crucial role in determining traits such as intelligence, personality, and certain physical characteristics. Genetic predispositions, inherited through DNA, are believed to contribute significantly to an individual's inherent qualities and abilities. Conversely, the nurture perspective emphasizes the impact of environmental factors, such as upbringing, socialization, education, and life experiences on human development. Advocates for the nurture position contend that external influences and life experiences shape an individual's behavior and personality, often surpassing the influence of genetic predispositions. Over time, the nature versus nurture debate has evolved beyond a polarized discussion to recognize the intricate interplay between genetic and environmental factors. Contemporary perspectives acknowledge that both nature and nurture contribute to human development, and their interactions are highly dynamic and complex. Advancements in fields like behavioral genetics have shown that genetic factors can influence susceptibility to certain traits or behaviors but the expression of these traits can be modulated by environmental influences. Similarly, environmental factors can have a profound impact on an individual, but to the degree to which they manifest may be influenced by genetic factors. The nature versus nurture debate remains relevant in understanding human development, informing educational practices, and contributing to discussions on individual differences. Contemporary research often takes an interactionist approach, recognizing the intertwined roles of genetic and environmental factors in shaping the complexity of human traits and behavior. The Butterfly versus Hurricane Analogy 
The butterfly versus hurricane analogy is a conceptual framework often used to illustrate the idea of chaos theory and the sensitivity of complex systems to initial conditions. The analogy draws a connection between the seemingly inconsequential actions of a butterfly flapping its wings and the potential for far-reaching consequences, even leading to major changes in weather patterns, symbolized by a hurricane. The central concept behind the analogy is known as the butterfly effect, coined by meteorologist Edward Lorenz. The butterfly effect suggests that a small change in one part of a system can have a cascading and amplified impact on the system as a whole. The term butterfly effect itself is a poetic way of expressing the idea that the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil could set off a chain of events that eventually leads to a tornado in Texas. In this analogy, the butterfly represents a tiny, seemingly insignificant action or event, while the hurricane represents a large, complex system with unpredictable and chaotic behavior. The point is to emphasize the sensitivity of certain systems to initial conditions, and the potential for small perturbations to have disproportionately large and unpredictable consequences. The butterfly versus hurricane analogy is not only used in meteorology, but also extends to various fields, including physics, economics, and social sciences. It highlights the challenges of predicting the long-term behavior of complex systems, where small changes or events can lead to divergent and unexpected outcomes. The analogy underscores the inherent complexity and non-linearity of many natural and human-made systems cautioning against overconfidence in our ability to predict their behavior over time. This conceptual framework encourages a humble acknowledgement of the limitations of our predictive abilities and fosters an appreciation for the intricate dynamics at play in complex systems. It invites researchers and thinkers to consider the interconnectedness of seemingly unrelated events and to recognize the potential for significant consequences arising from small, initial perturbations in various domains of study. The Ripple Effect Metaphysics The Ripple Effect Metaphysics is a conceptual framework that suggests that every action, regardless of its scale or significance, initiates a chain of interconnected consequences that resonates throughout the fabric of existence. This theory embodies the idea that individual actions, like ripples spreading across the surface of water, can have far-reaching and interconnected effects, influencing not only immediate surroundings but also contributing to broader and more profound consequences. At its core, the ripple effect metaphysics aligns with the broader philosophical and metaphysical notion of interconnectedness and the interdependence of all things. This perspective implies that the universe is a complex web of relationships, where every action and event is interconnected with others in ways that may not be immediately apparent. The metaphor of ripples on water captures the dynamic and expansive nature of the consequences of actions. Much like the way a small stone dropped into a pond creates concentric waves that spread outward, each action sets off a sequence of events that can touch various aspects of existence. This metaphor is often used to convey the idea that our choices and behaviors have consequences that extend beyond our immediate awareness, influencing the interconnected web of life. The ripple effect metaphysics finds resonance in various fields, including ethics, environmentalism, and systems thinking. It encourages individuals to consider the potential impact of their actions on the broader context and to recognize the interconnectedness of the choices we make. From a moral standpoint, it emphasizes the ethical responsibility associated with understanding the potential consequences of one's actions on others and the environment. The Infinite Regress the infinite regress is a philosophical concept that arises when a proposition or belief requires another proposition for its justification, and this process of justification continues indefinitely, forming an infinite chain. The notion of an infinite regress poses challenges to the idea of providing a satisfactory foundation or justification for beliefs, arguments, or knowledge. In philosophical discourse, the infinite regress is often discussed as a potential problem within certain theories of justification or explanation.
When attempting to establish the validity or justification of a claim, one might provide reasons or evidence to support that claim. However, if each supporting reason itself requires further justification, and this process continues indefinitely, it raises questions about whether any proposition can be adequately justified. This concept is closely related to the idea of epistemic justification, which deals with the rational grounds for accepting or believing a particular proposition. In an infinite regress scenario, the process of providing justifications seems to lack a foundational endpoint, leading to an infinite chain of reasons. Philosophers grapple with the infinite regress in various contexts, including theories of knowledge, ethics, and metaphysics. For example, in epistemology, foundationalists and coherentists offer different approaches to address this issue. Foundationalists seek basic, self-justifying beliefs that serve as foundations for knowledge, while coherentists argue that beliefs gain justification through their coherence with a network of other beliefs. The infinite regress highlights the challenges in establishing a secure foundation for knowledge and beliefs. It prompts philosophical inquiry into the nature of justification, the possibility of foundational beliefs, and the coherence of belief systems. The Alcubierre Drive Dilemma The Alcubierre Drive Dilemma encapsulates both scientific and ethical quandaries associated with the theoretical concept of faster-than-light FTL, travel, particularly through the lens of the Alcubierre Drive. On the scientific front, the feasibility of the Alcubierre Drive is a major point of contention. While the drive is an intriguing solution within the framework of general relativity, it relies on the existence of exotic matter with negative energy density, a substance that remains speculative and has not been observed in nature. The scientific community grapples with the question of whether negative energy density is a physically plausible and achievable component, casting doubt on the practical realization of the Alcubierre drive. The ethical dimension of the Alcubierre drive dilemma delves into the potential consequences and responsible use of FTL travel. Should such a propulsion system become feasible, ethical questions arise regarding the implications of interstellar exploration, colonization, and contact with extraterrestrial civilizations. The mere possibility of FTL travel prompts contemplation on the unintended consequences that may accompany such advancements. Ethical considerations extend to issues like environmental impact on newly encountered ecosystems, potential conflicts arising from the expansion into uncharted territories, and the responsible use and dissemination of advanced technology. Furthermore, the ethical discourse encompasses questions of resource allocation and the equitable distribution of the benefits and burdens associated with FTL travel. The Alcubierre Drive Dilemma underscores the importance of incorporating ethical considerations into scientific endeavors, emphasizing the need for responsible stewardship and thoughtful exploration of the broader implications of groundbreaking technologies. As speculative physics intersects with ethical inquiry, addressing the Alcubierre Drive Dilemma becomes a multifaceted endeavor, necessitating collaboration between scientific, philosophical, and ethical perspectives to navigate the complexities of potential advancements in FTL travel. The Self-Ownership Principle The Self-Ownership Principle is a fundamental philosophical concept that posits individuals as the rightful owners of themselves, asserting autonomy and control over their bodies and lives. This principle forms the cornerstones of various ethical, political, and legal theories, serving as a foundational idea in the discussions about individual rights, personal freedom, and the limits of external authority. At its core, the self-ownership principle contends that individuals have inherent moral and legal ownership of their own bodies and minds. This ownership implies that individuals possess the right to make decisions about their lives, bodies, and personal choices without unwarranted interference from external entities. The principle is deeply intertwined in the concept of individual autonomy, emphasizing the inherent dignity and sovereignty of each person. In political philosophy, the self-ownership principle is often associated with libertarian and classical liberal ideologies, 
It forms the basis for arguments in favor of limited government intervention, personal liberty, and the protection of individual rights. Advocates of the self-ownership principle argue that respecting individuals' autonomy leads to a more just and equitable society, allowing people the freedom to pursue their own goals and live according to their values. However, the application and interpretation of the self-ownership principle can vary across different philosophical traditions and ethical frameworks. Critics may challenge its absoluteness, pointing out potential conflicts between individual autonomy and societal interests, or they may explore how cultural, economic, or historical factors influence the exercise of self-ownership.